Dead America, Heartland, Part 2, Dead America, The Second Week, Book 2. Written by Derek Slayton. Narrated by P.J. Morgan. Chapter 1. Day 0 plus 9. The train moseyed at 15 miles per hour. Bill sat at the helm, keeping watch for any obstructions on the tracks ahead. Where in the hell are we, anyway? Corporal Bretz asked, squinting out the window as the sun peeked over the horizon. Private Kowalski shrugged. Somewhere in South Dakota, I think, he replied, peering out himself at the desolate landscape surrounding them. Southwest Wyoming, actually. Crossed over the line sometime during the night. Bill cut in, stretching his neck from side to side. Bretz wrinkled his nose. Well, that explains why there ain't a damn thing out here. Right, because South Dakota is known for its wide swaths of civilization, Kowalski snorted. They all lurched forward, Kowalski nearly barreling into Sergeant Kersey next to him as the train screeched to a stop. Christ, what now? Bretz grunted, getting to his feet to stand over Bill's shoulder. I'm getting really tired of clearing the tracks of debris. Can't you just roll through whatever it is? The engineer shook his head. Pretty sure that ain't gonna work this time he replied, motioning ahead. The corporal bent at the waist to look out, and his jaw dropped. About 40 yards ahead sat a beastly train, stopped dead on the tracks. From what they could see from their position, it was a long string of cars, and they weren't able to see the end of it. What in the hell do we do about this? Kowalski asked from behind them, letting out a deep whoosh of breath. Bill pulled a paper map out of the little nook next to his seat spreading it out on his lap. If I'm reading this right, and I'd like to think that I am, we're about 20 miles south of Moorcroft, Wyoming. With any luck, they'll have a side in there. Siding? Bretz raised an eyebrow. Yeah, think of it like a passing lane on a highway, Bill explained. If there's one out there, I can get this big bitch out of our way and we'll be back on track. He stretched his arms above his head and yawned. Pun not intended. He grabbed his bottle of water from beside him and took a long swig, then splashed a little on his face. When's the last time you slept? Kowalski asked gently, putting a hand on the older man's shoulder. Hell if I know, Bill replied, taking a deep breath. All I know is that I'm definitely over my allotted hours for the week. Brads chuckled. Don't worry, we ain't gonna report you. Well, that's good, the engineer said with a toothy grin. Because snitches get stitches. The corporal's eyebrows shot up. You'd actually stab me? If it's any consolation, I'd feel bad about it afterwards. Bill shrugged, and he and Kowalski shared a laugh. Kersey stood up from his quiet spot on the floor and cracked his knuckles. Kowalski, Bretz, escort Bill up to the engine of that other train. I'm going to let General Stevens know about our progress. On it, Sarge, Bretz replied with a salute. Kowalski put up a hand. Wait, how in the hell are we gonna get both trains up to that Sidon or whatever it's called? You've been watching me do this for two solid days now, Bill said, pushing the throttle back and forth. I'd hope you can step up and move this thing about ten miles an hour. You think you can handle it? The private straightened, puffing his chest out. Do I get a conductor hat? Bill shook his head and chuckled. He didn't bother correcting the young man that he wasn't a conductor but an engineer. Tell you what. He clapped him on the back. First one I find is all yours. Let's do it, Kowalski replied with a firm nod, and the trio exited the cab. Kersey turned away from the door and slid on a headset, leaning against the wall as he fiddled with the dials on his radio. Heartland Base, Heartland Base, come in, he said. This is Sergeant Kersey. He waited patiently for a few minutes, the silence stretching out on the other end. Heartland Base, please respond. This is Heartland Base, came the reply. We'll read you loud and clear, Sergeant Kersey. I have a priority alpha update and need to speak to General Stevens immediately. Please hold, I will get that set up for you. Kersey nodded. I appreciate it. At the click, he turned and stared out the window, watching the horizon illuminating in the morning sun. After all they'd been through, he felt like he would never be able to truly relax, but the sight of the rolling hills, with nary a corpse wandering around, definitely gave him comfort. 
The train wasn't the most comfortable thing in the world, but it was nice to have a bit of a break from being on high alert. There was a series of clicks, and then a familiar voice came through. Sergeant Kersey, good to hear from you. General Stevens greeted him. What's your current location? General, we're currently about 20 miles south of Moorcroft, Wyoming, Kersey replied. There was an audible sigh on the other end. You're going to have to pick up the pace. I understand, the sergeant agreed. Bill has informed me that we should be able to speed up for a while, since there's not much between us and Helena, Montana. He's just been playing it extra careful, since the last thing we want is to get derailed by debris. Level with me. Is he being overly cautious? Well, we're currently stopped because there's an abandoned train on the tracks, Kersey informed him. So I think he's taking the right amount of precaution. I know you boys are doing the best you can, Stevens came back, and his subordinate could almost hear the pursing of his lips. But I can't stress enough that the pace needs to be quickened as much as possible. The sergeant's brow furrowed. Has, has something happened, sir? The order has come down from the top, the general said. We have a target for the offensive against the enemy. And I'm guessing that since you haven't ordered me to reverse course, Kersey prompted, that you were right all along? Stevens clucked his tongue. Yes, that's right. We're going to Seattle. I always did want to go to the Space Needle, the sergeant replied wistfully. The general barked a bitter laugh. By all accounts, it's still standing, he replied which is more than can be said about some other monuments. Is there a timeline for the assault? Kersey asked. At least a week, maybe more, Stevens explained. Going to depend on how quickly we can move the troops up. The sergeant nodded and then took a deep breath. And how is that going? Better than expected, the general admitted. The path you boys cleared for us from North Platte to Salina has given us a staging area pipeline, we have a couple of trains running around the clock, shuttling troops and supplies to North Platte, although we could use another staging area further up the line if you come across one. I think we're going to have to take some time in Moorcroft, Kersey said, so we'll give it a good once over and see if it'll work. Sergeant, Stevens replied sternly, what did I just say about picking up the pace? Kersey sighed heavily and pinched the bridge of his nose. Bill hasn't slept in two days, sir. We need to give him at least a few hours to recoup. And besides, it'll give us a chance to restock. There was a pause. Understood, the general finally said. You boys doing okay on supplies? Food provisions are decent, but we could always use more, the sergeant said. And ammo? Kersey half smiled. Enough to make us dangerous? Stevens barked a more genuine laugh this time. I have no doubt. I'll be in touch once we head out of Moorcroft this afternoon, Kersey assured him. Safe travels, Sergeant, the general replied, and there was a sharp click as the line went dead. Kersey removed the headset and took a deep breath, stretching his arms above his head. He watched the last bit of the sunrise, enjoying the feel of the rays on his face and the little bit of tranquility that he could grasp in times like these. Chapter Two Brett's led the trio, Bill nestled safely in between he and Kowalski, who brought up the rear. The corporal stayed vigilant, keeping his weapon raised and pausing at each gap between the abandoned train cars to check for threats. His partner's head swiveled this way and that behind them, double-checking that they weren't missing anything. Everything seemed quiet, but they knew better than to let their guard down. So what do you think this thing is hauling? Kowalski asked as they walked. Bill knocked on the side of one of the train cars, resulting in a hollow echo. I'd be willing to stake my reputation that this one ain't hauling shit. He chuckled and shrugged, pausing at the next gap. Seriously, though, with cars like this and where we are, it's a pretty safe bet it was hauling coal. Brett's waved the all clear for that gap, and they continued up along the next car. Bill knocked on the side of that one the same metallic echo replying to him. Good news for us is that it looks like it's already dumped its load. We should be able to get this thing moving pretty quickly. All right, Brett's declared as he stopped them at the engine cab. I'll check it out. You two stay here. He motioned to the closed door and slowly climbed the ladder next to it. As he reached the window, 
A zombie smashed into it from the inside, startling the corporal into raising his weapon. He held his fire when his rational brain kicked in, the corpse trapped inside the cab with no way out. It had a pinstripe shirt on, common to train engineers, but donned a baseball cap so bloodied it was impossible to tell what team it had once been for. Hey, Kowalski, Bretz tapped on the glass with the barrel of his gun. I think I found you a hat. The private raised an eyebrow in distaste at the crimson-soaked garment. Yeah, pretty sure I'm gonna pass on that one. The zombie smacked a rotting hand wetly against the glass, gnawing as it tried to get out to its fresh meal. Bill stepped forward and wrapped his hand around one of the ladder rungs. Whoa there, Kowalski huffed, jumping forward to grab the older man's shoulder. Stay down here until Brett's clears it. If it's all the same to you, I'd like to make sure he's aiming in the right direction. Bill replied, gently shaking his arm out of the private's hand. Last thing we need is for him to inadvertently hit something vital, because I get the sense that you boys don't want to push this train by hand. The corporal pursed his lips for a moment and then waved for Bill to climb up. He moved over to give him room, and the engineer flinched when the zombie turned its face hungrily towards him. Relax, it can't get you, Bratz assured him. The engineer shook his head. It ain't that, he said, swallowing hard. Just recognize him, that's all. Oh, the corporal replied, blinking a few times. Sorry to hear that. Bill waved him off. Eh, don't be, he was an asshole. He shook his head and peered around the familiar rotting head into the cab to get the lay of the land. All right, you're gonna have to line your shot upward so that it goes straight through the other window. Think you can do it? Bratz nodded. Got you covered. He climbed around the engineer, taking the space back at the window. He tapped on the glass with the barrel again, hoping to lure the corpse into position. The zombie thrashed about a bit, screams muffled by the door, and then finally pressed itself against the center of the window. The corporal squeezed the trigger, and the glass chinked as the bullet tore through it, the zombie's forehead, and into the window on the far side. The trio waited a beat to make sure that the crack of the gun hadn't alerted anything else to their presence. Finally, Bretz unlatched the door, stepping out of the way. Watch yourself, Kowalski, it's coming your way. The private stepped to the side as his partner opened the door, and the zombie fell down to the dirt with a wet splat. Yum, he muttered with distaste, and then took up a defensive position as his teammates entered the cab. Bill checked all of the gauges, inspecting all of the panels. He had to wipe blood from a few to see clearly, but for the most part, things didn't look broken. How are we looking? Bretz asked. The engineer nodded. I think we're ready to roll. He leaned out the door to address Kowalski. All right, you take it nice and slow. You don't move until we are out of your sight, and for the love of Christ, don't go above ten miles an hour. I think I can manage faster than ten miles an hour. Kowalski rolled his eyes. Ten miles per hour, Bill repeated firmly. You may only have three cars attached, but it's still gonna take you some distance to bring that thing to a stop. You ain't driving your minivan today, you're driving a man's vehicle. So do as I say, because if you fuck it up and rear-end us, I'm gonna have to bust my ass switching engines. And if your stupidity makes me have to do that, I'm gonna have someone bring me a dog leash and I'll drag your ass for the next 50 miles. He raised an eyebrow. And if you don't believe I can, well, I'd say you can ask old Eddie Hibbert. But when we got to our next stop, the only thing there was an empty leash. Kowalski stared up at him, wide-eyed, and nodded slowly. Okay, he said hoarsely. Ten miles per hour it is. Good boy, Bill replied. Now you run along and radio up to us when you're ready to roll. Bretz watched with bewilderment as Kowalski scurried off down the train tracks, and Bill casually went back to getting the engine fired up. He opened his mouth, closed it again, and then opened it again, then closed it again. He shrugged his shoulders and shook his head with a chuckle. All right, I gotta know, he finally said. That story about Eddie Hibbert, that wasn't true, was it? Bill smiled sheepishly. Well, not entirely. Bratz let out a deep sigh of relief. They had enough to worry about with the flesh-eating zombies without a psychopathic engineer. Bill shook his head. 
Dog leashes aren't really long enough, so I had to use a horse lead line instead. Chapter Three Bill pioneered the train slowly down the track, the weight making it difficult to get up to speed. He also knew that they'd need to stop short of the siding so they could flip the switch, so there was no use trying to go too fast. His eyelids began to droop. Unfortunately, driving a slow train was just as bad as highway hypnosis. Brett's furrowed his brow as the engineer's shoulders began to slump and gave him a sharp clap on the back. Yeah, yeah, I'm good, Bill mumbled as he straightened back up. The corporal shook his head. That didn't sound very convincing. I didn't really buy it either, the engineer replied, voice thick and groggy. Bratz crossed his arms. I've got an idea, he said. Why don't you tell me about some of the crazy shit you've seen out here on the rails? Keep your mind active and awake. That could work, Bill agreed, giving his cheek a little smack and blinking back sleep. Before I get started, though, I gotta ask, you don't get grossed out easily, do you? The corporal snorted. I've spent the last week and a half fighting the undead. If you find a way to outgross that, I'll consider it an achievement. Fair enough, the engineer replied. But don't say I didn't warn you. He leaned forward to recheck one of the gauges and then took a deep breath. So this happened a few years back. I don't remember what run we were on exactly, but it was one of the more scenic trips through the middle of nowhere. It was towards the end of August, so hot as a motherfucker outside. We weren't close to any crossings, so we had it opened up to about 60 miles an hour, just screaming down the tracks. Well, we came around this bend to a bridge over a lake, and about shit ourselves when we saw 40 or so cows just hanging out in the middle. Bratz laughed. What the fuck? What were cows doing in the middle of a bridge over a lake? Hell if I know, Bill chuckled and shook his head. I think the incident report said some car wreck nearby took out a farmer's fence. But at the time, we didn't care why they were there, only that they were. So what did you do? The corporal cocked his head. Bill clucked his tongue. The only thing we could do, kept rolling full steam ahead. Why didn't you stop? Bratz asked, eyes wide. We had a full load, the engineer explained. So even if we hit the emergency brakes, we'd still be a mile past the bridge by the time we stopped. The corporal winced. I'm guessing it didn't go well. No, sir, it did not, Bill assured him. Those cows exploded like a pinata at a kid's birthday party, and let me assure you, there wasn't any candy inside. Bratz hissed a sharp breath through his teeth. Ugh, cow guts everywhere. Oh, not just cow guts, the engineer replied with a maniacal grin. Cow body parts, cow shit, cow heads, cow everything everywhere. The impact was so severe that it coated the entire front of the engine in it, and thanks to the extreme heat, it pretty much fused to it, including the front windows. We had to spend the next six hours with our heads sticking out the portholes just to be able to see where we were going. Now, I don't know if you've ever smelled roadkill up close, but I can guarantee to you that you've never smelled a couple tons of roadkill cooking as you roll down the road. Bratz blinked at him in shock. Holy shit he breathed. That's horrific. I tell you how bad it was, it actually killed my taste for steak for about a month, Bill declared. The corporal shook his head. I can imagine. Lucky for you, you really can't, Bill said, and they shared a laugh. He leaned forward and flipped a few switches and began to pull back gently on the throttle. Bratz furrowed his brow. What is it? I don't see a town. Found a siding. Bill explained, motioning ahead. Go on and radio back to Kowalski and get him to slow down. The corporal lifted his radio to his mouth and clicked the button. Hey, Kowalski, you copy? Yep, I'm here, came the reply. Look, man, we're slowing down, so go ahead and throttle back, Brett said. There was a crackle before Kowalski replied. I'll make sure I stop plenty short of you. As the train came to a full stop, Bill stepped over to the door and heaved it open. Whoa, hang on, Brett scushed, grabbing his gun and running forward. You aren't going out there. Wasn't planning on it, the engineer replied with an amused smile. I was just being polite and opening the door for you. Brett shook his head and ran a hand through his hair. What do you need me to do? There's gonna be a manual switch up there, Bill explained, pointing through the window. 
I'll just need you to flip it so that the rail runs off to the left there. Once you do, I'll pick you up and we'll park this big bitch. The corporal nodded and leaned out the door, doing a quick sweep of the immediate area. There were no zombies in sight, no movement of any kind anywhere. He hopped down and headed towards the switch post quickly, gun at the ready just in case. He cocked his head at the track and looked up at the large lever, finally grasping it in one hand and heaving it down. He watched the rails to make doubly sure that the track was all the way over to the switched position. The last thing they needed was a derailment. Bretts nodded at his handiwork and gave Bill the thumbs up before taking a few steps backwards and waiting for his ride to approach. As Bill cleared the switch, the corporal changed it back for Kowalski and then jogged up the train to escort the engineer out to safety. They waited patiently outside as Kowalski brought up their train. It inched forward at a snail's pace, the private obviously nervous about parking in exactly the right spot. After a few minutes of this, Bill shook his head and waved Brett's forward, heading towards the door. The engineer grabbed the still-moving train's ladder and climbed up, opening the door just as the transport finally came to a stop. How did I do? Kowalski asked, excitement evident in his voice. Bill shrugged as he headed over. Well, you didn't hit the other train or run me over, so I'll give you a thumbs up. Hey, I'll take it, the private exclaimed, holding up a fist of triumph as Bretts joined them in the cab. I'll get us back up and rolling, Bill said, taking his place at the helm. Moorcroft should be just up ahead, Kersey said, leaning over to peer out the front window. When you see it, stop short of it. If there is anyone in town, I don't want to make it obvious we're here. The engineer raised an eyebrow. I thought we had to keep pushing through. You obviously need some sleep, the sergeant explained. And I talked to General Stevens. They're ready to start moving troops out, and they need a layover spot. I told him we'd check out the town to see if it was viable. Bill shrugged. Fair enough. Next stop, Moorcroft. Chapter 4 Brett's go wake up the others, Kersey instructed as the train came to a stop just outside of town. He surveyed the land before them, a few run-down houses in the distance, and a large two-story building by a football field. It looked like there was a nice suburb across from that. The corporal saluted and opened the door. On it. Kowalski, get on top of the train and sweep for potential threats. The sergeant continued, and then turned to give his private a stern glare. No shooting, just looking. Kowalski feigned a pout. You're no fun. He slipped out the door, leaving it open so they could hear him if he needed to call down. Bretts wandered back to the first train car, gun raised in case of any surprises, and unlatched the door. As he slid it open, three sleepy-eyed soldiers squinted at him in the sun, looking for all the world like they needed a snooze button. Rise and shine, boys, Bretts barked. We've got work to do. Private Buck Johnson dragged himself up into a sitting position, stretching his arms above his head. For the love of Christ, Bretts, it's too damn early in the morning. Hey, come on now, the corporal chirped. I let you sleep in until the sun came up. That's got to count for something, right? Private Ben Mason rubbed his eyes and yawned. What we got this time, he asked. Another car in the road? Oh no, we've already cleared an entire train off of the tracks while you sleeping beauties were off in dreamland, Brett said. Private Adam Baker rolled over so that his back was to the sunlight. So why the fuck are we awake? Because General Stevens needs a rest stop, and we gotta find him one. Brett jabbed the lazy soldier in the back with the barrel of his gun. So get your shit and come on. He walked back towards the cab as the three soldiers trudged to their feet. Ugh. Baker groaned. I'm not a morning person at all. Johnson laughed as he picked up his rifle and jumped to the ground. Then why in the hell did you join the army? Eh, my dad was in it, Baker replied with a shrug as he wiped the last of the sleep from his eyes. When I turned 18, I figured, why the hell not? Mason slid down after him to the ground and brought up the rear. Good a reason as any, I suppose. Kowalski peered through the scope of his sniper rifle, getting the lay of the land. Hey, Sarge, he called, and waited for Kersey's head to pop up from the door. 
Looks like the streets are pretty clear. Can't tell if there's anybody in the school or not, but ain't nobody outside as far as I can tell. Although I will say based on the look of the houses, we're definitely gonna want to stay near the school. How's the town layout look? Kersey asked. The private shook his head. Hard to tell from here, but looks like the bulk of structures are to the north and west of the school on that side of the tracks, he replied. It's pretty much open field on this side of things. The sergeant nodded. All right, let's get geared up. He lowered himself down. Bill climbed out of the cab and locked it up tight and headed down the ladder before Kowalski joined them on the ground. Okay, here's the deal, Kersey declared as the group converged in front of the train. Bill, Kowalski, and I are going to take up residence in the big house directly across from the school entrance. Bretts, Mason, I want you two to head to the west, see what you can find. Johnson, Baker, I want you to take the north. If you see supplies, note it. If you see zombies trapped in structures, note it. If you see anything that might be of value, note it. I need to be able to tell General Stevens if this is a viable stop over point or not, so all info is welcome. Questions? Mason raised his hand. What if we encounter locals? Ignore them as best you can, the sergeant replied firmly. Johnson's face erupted into a wolfish grin. What if it's a pretty young thing? Kowalski snorted. Then she'll ignore you. A chuckle rippled through the group before Kersey put up a hand. If you encounter locals, make damn sure they know we're just passing through, he said. If they ask for help, tell them there's some on the way. Baker cocked his head. And if they're hostile? De-escalate if you can, Kersey replied. And if you can't, he raised his rifle. Make them de-escalate. There was a chorus of somber, yes, sir. And then the sergeant turned to Bill. How much sleep do you need, he asked. A few hours will get me through, the engineer assured him. Kersey nodded. Four-hour mission timer, then we rendezvous at the train, he declared. Any questions? At the shuffle of shaking heads, he took up an offensive position, facing the town. All right, let's get it done. Move out. Chapter 5 Kersey brought up the back of his trio, Kowalski leading he and Bill towards the school, guns at the ready and ears perked as they went. They jogged across the deserted football field, patches of grass sporting splatters of crimson. They came around the bleachers towards the parking lot, and the private suddenly took a knee. The other two quickly followed suit, Kersey shuffling around the engineer. What is it? he asked. Kowalski peered through the scope of his rifle taking in the school across the lot. There were a handful of cars with no action, but to the right, there was an eight-foot fence surrounding a square of asphalt. There were a few dozen corpses trapped inside, milling about aimlessly, bouncing off of the chain link in vain. Looks like somebody rounded up some zombies and put them in a holding pen, he said quietly. Bill blinked at his companions. Why in the hell would anybody want to hang on to those things? Right? The private agreed with a shrug. Pretty sure they'd make shitty pets. Kersey furrowed his brow. Do you see any movement at the school? Kowalski studied every window facing them, but it looked like each one had the shutters closed tight. The doors were closed as well, and he lowered the rifle with a shake of his head. If there is anybody in there, he said, they don't want us to know about it. Everything is shut up tighter than a schoolgirl on prom night. Bill snorted. You and I went to very different high schools. Let's move quickly and along the edge of the parking lot, Kersey instructed. Use the cars for cover and try to stay out of sight. If there are people in there, I don't want them to know we're here. He straightened his shoulders at their nods and then waved for them to move out. Kowalski led them across the lot, staying ducked down as low as they could get. They dashed behind cars hoping to avoid spooking the trapped zombies as well and alerting anything else nearby to their presence. They flattened themselves against the last sedan on the far end, and the private did a quick scan through his scope again. Sarge, there's a whole lot of nothing between us and the house, he said quietly. Hell, they even left the front door open for us. Kersey drew in a sharp breath. Something feels off about this. His heart skipped a beat and his two companions seemed to be contemplating their gut feelings as well. 
I can sleep on the train, Bill suggested. The sergeant shook his head. No, whatever it is, we'll deal with it, he insisted. But we're going to play it safe. Kowalski, when we get to the house, we clear the front room, then you find a corner, put Bill in it, and stay there while I clear the rest of the house, understood? The private nodded. Yes, sir. Let's move then, Kersey said, and waved them forward. They dashed out from behind the sedan and rushed across the street, bursting through the open doorway with guns at the ready. The two soldiers swept the front room, finding it quiet and empty. Kowalski grabbed Bill's arm and jerked him towards a plush chair in the corner, near tossing him into it. The engineer landed on his ass with a soft oof, but the soft cushions were a godsend to his sore body. The private stepped in front of him and took up a defensive stance, shoulders squared and handgun ready. Kersey moved through the house, easing open door after door and meeting no resistance. The feeling of foreboding and dread that had been gripping his heart began to loosen its hold on his stomach, and finally he returned to the front room, holstering his weapon. We're clear, he declared. Kowalski, secure the front door and I'll do the same for the back. Bill raised his hand from the easy chair. And me? Master bedroom is down the hall, Kersey replied, inclining his head in that direction. Looks pretty untouched, so you should be comfortable. The engineer leapt up from the chair, a spring in his step. He'd been excited about the chair, but a comfortable bed? He practically dove into the master bedroom. If you all find coffee in the kitchen, for the love of God, make sure you save me a cup. Kersey smiled. Consider it done. Sweet dreams, Kowalski called in a sing-song voice. Bill shook his head in amusement, rubbing his eyes as he shut the door behind him. Man, now that he mentioned it, coffee would be fan-fucking-tastic right about now, the private said, letting out a wistful breath. He reached over to the light switch on the wall and flicked it, but nothing happened. Ah, a boy could dream, Kersey shrugged. I'll check the cupboard, maybe we'll get lucky. Not gonna do much good without power, Sarge, Kowalski said. The sergeant shook his head. The stove is gas, so while the coffee might not be entirely up to your standards, it'll be a drinkable, caffeinated beverage. Fuck, I'll take it, the soldier grinned with renewed vigor. Kersey rummaged through the kitchen cupboards, and in the cabinet next to the fridge, he found a massive can of ground coffee. Found some, he called, and heard a noise of triumph from his comrade. While I brew it up, I want you to watch that school like a fucking hawk, the sergeant instructed. If those shutters so much as rattle in the breeze, I want to know about it. Got you covered, Sarge, Kowalski promised from the front door, raising his rifle. He peered through the scope like a hunter awaiting a deer, watching the eerily quiet building. A few minutes later, Kersey brought a mug of steaming liquid to his companion, taking a seat on the bench beside the front door. Kowalski took it, eyes lighting up as he took a deep sniff of the dark brew. Nectar of the gods, this is, he purred, and then took a sip. Kersey inclined his head towards the door. How's the school looking, he asked. Whole lot of nothing, Sarge, the private replied, shaking his head. Keep watching, the sergeant replied, and stood back up, stretching his arms above his head. I'll keep an eye on the back. Kowalski shot him a wolfish grin. You just want to be near the coffee. Benefits of a higher rank, soldier. Kersey winked and strutted back to the kitchen to pour his own cup of wake-up juice. Chapter Six On the west side of town, Brett and Mason strolled along a side street at a steady pace. The train tracks ran parallel to the sidewalk, within dashing distance if they needed to get away from any approaching zombies. The coast had been clear so far, the quiet, sleepy town living up to the reputation Kowalski had declared it as. Hey, man, can I ask you something? Mason broke the morning quiet. Bretts raised an eyebrow. What's that? The private took a deep breath. Do you think this whole Seattle invasion thing is a good idea? He chewed his lip. That's the beauty of being a grunt, man, the corporal replied with a shrug. They don't ask my opinion on shit like that. They just tell me that it's a good idea and I roll with it. Mason scoffed. Oh, come on, you gotta have an opinion on it. He waved a hand vaguely in front of him. 
They're about to throw us into one of the largest cities in the country to take on hundreds of thousands of those dead things. Doesn't that make you nervous? It's not like we have any other options at our disposal, Bretz replied, his shoulders rising and falling again, though he avoided his companion's gaze. We can't stay in Kansas, too many fronts to defend. If we don't try something drastic like this, then the country is just going to segment into many kingdoms filled with handfuls of survivors. I don't know about you, but I'd rather fight and die for something bigger than myself, rather than simply fight to survive an extra day. Mason let out a whoosh of breath. I gotcha, man, but it's just... He swallowed hard. I grew up in the city, tied quarters with a shitload of people. Everywhere you went, just people, people, people. This, this isn't going to be pleasant. All-out war isn't typically pleasant, the corporal said quietly. They approached a corner and slowed down, taking in their surroundings. There was a diner across the street with a hotel behind it, sharing a parking lot. They swept the area, but there was still no sign of life or unlife. They almost expected to see tumbleweeds bumbling down the road. What do you say, bud? You hungry? Bretz asked, motioning to the diner. As if on cue, Mason's stomach growled, and he chuckled. Fuck yeah, I am, he said. If I have to eat one more MRE, I'm gonna puke. They raised their guns and slowly moved across the street, senses on high alert for any movement. The quiet was almost foreboding, leaving a heaviness in the corporal's stomach that he was having a hard time shaking. He ducked through the open door of the diner, leading a quick sweep of the old-timey space. Clear, he said, as he inspected behind the counter. Mason took in the black and white checkered floor and 50s-style decor. Clear, he agreed, and followed his companion through the floppy doors into the kitchen. It was a small space, but the whole back wall was all shelving. They were both disappointed to find that the shelves were completely bare, picked clean. There was not a single thing left, not even the refills for the soda machine. Motherfucker, Mason muttered. Not a single thing left. He kicked at an empty bucket in frustration. Bretz furrowed his brow in concern. Yeah, it sucks, he agreed. But we have bigger issues. What's that? The private asked sullenly, the visions of fresh burgers that had been dancing in his head, evaporating into thin air. The corporal ran a hand along one of the stainless steel shelves. Someone cleaned this place out, which means more than likely there are people here, he explained and if they're this methodical, they might not like the fact that we're poking around. Mason took pause, eyes widening with the revelation. You want me to let Sarge know? Yeah, that's a good idea, Bretz replied, waving for him to go ahead and then heading over to the back office. He half listened to his companion filling in the sergeant as he inspected the cramped space, which had curiously also been completely cleared out. Even the desk drawers were wholly empty. He emerged back into the kitchen, and something caught his eye out the window. Mason, I need to talk to the Sarge, he declared, and the private blinked at him. Hey, hold up a sec, he said into the radio. Bretz needs to speak to you. He furrowed his brow as he handed over the device, and then followed the corporal's gaze out the window. What the fuck, he breathed, and his jaw dropped. Across the parking lot, there were eight zombies chained up in front of the main entrance to the hotel. Their makeshift leashes were secured to the metal handicap parking poles, with a few feet of give, giving them enough reach to cover a good semicircle guarding the door. We may have an issue, Brett said into the radio. There was a crackle, and Kersey came back. What you got, Corporal? Everything seems to have been completely cleaned out, he explained except for the hotel. What's in the hotel? The sergeant asked. Bratz shook his head. Not a fucking clue, he admitted, mainly because someone saw fit to have half a dozen zombie guard dogs chained outside the front door. Shit, Kersey replied. Somebody caged up a whole mess of them by the school, too. Have you seen anybody? Bratz asked, running a hand through his hair. Living, that is? Another crackle. Negative, the sergeant reported. You? Not a soul, the corporal said. So either they've abandoned the town, they're hiding from us, or... 
They're just waiting to strike, Kersey finished. Bratz pursed his lips. How do you want to play it, Sarge? There was a moment of silence. How much more of the city you have to look over? Three, maybe four blocks until we hit the edge, the corporal replied. Do a quick sweep and head for the house, Kersey instructed. I'll tell Johnson and Baker to do the same. Make sure you enter through the back and stay out of sight of the school. If there is somebody out there waiting to strike us, we're going to make sure they pay a high price for it. On it, Sarge, Bretz replied with a firm nod. We'll be there soon, over and out. He tossed the radio back to Mason, who barely caught it in his shock at the weird scene in front of the hotel. So fucked up, the private muttered as he secured the walkie-talkie and raised his weapon once again. Bretz nodded. It'll be so nice if one of these days we can just have a leisurely stroll through town without someone or something wanting to kill us, he said wistfully. Mason couldn't help but laugh. One day, Brits, one day. Chapter 7 On the north side of town, Johnson and Baker worked their way through the kitchen of a middle-class quality house. Ugh. Johnson scoffed as he slammed the last cupboard closed. Fifth straight house without a goddamn thing in it. Baker scrubbed his hands down the sides of his face. I'm starting to think we should just call it and head back to meet up with Sarge. Yeah, I'm with you, Bubba, his companion agreed. Let's go hit that church at the top of the street, and then we'll head back. Baker raised an eyebrow. If all the houses are empty, why would you think the church wouldn't be? I don't know. Johnson admitted as he checked his gun. Just kind of hoping that they didn't think to raid the communion wine. His partner barked a laugh. You know, bud, you might have a bit of an alcohol problem. Well, I'm trying to. Johnson rolled his eyes. This apocalypse is making it pretty damn difficult, though. They shared a chuckle and headed outside. As they turned up the road, Johnson caught sight of a figure dashing into the backyard of a neighboring house. He raised his weapon and froze, waiting for any more movement. What are we trying to kill, Johnson? Baker asked, having followed suit with his gun at the ready. His partner clenched his jaw. I saw something run down the side of the house. Okay, Baker replied, clapping him on the shoulder. Let's go get it then. Johnson nodded. Follow me up, then flank me when we get to the driveway, he instructed and they moved in cautious unison towards the driveway. As they hit the asphalt, Baker darted over to the other side, and they headed towards the garage door, which was slightly open. With a large wooden privacy fence enclosing any areas between houses, it was clear where their culprit had gone. The privates each took a side of the garage, and Johnson raised his hand, silently counting down from five. As he got to one, Baker curled his hand under the bottom of the door and hauled it up, his partner ducking underneath. Johnson swept the room quickly, on high alert as his companion covered his back, and then honed in on a figure in the back. They were frantically attempting to open the back door, but it seemed it was locked from the outside. Hands up, Johnson demanded, and the figure grunted in frustration, stepping away from the door. Hands up, he repeated and took another step forward. The figure whirled around and pressed her back against the wall. She looked to be in her early twenties, her shoulder-length black hair tousled and eyes as wide as saucers. What used to be a simple t-shirt and jeans was in tatters, revealing cuts and bruises all caked with different shades of dried blood. She raised her hands, the left firmly gripping a small paring knife. Baker gently put his hand on his partner's rifle, pushing the barrel down. What are you doing? Johnson hissed. Baker pursed his lips. Following orders. It dawned on the spooked private what his partner was talking about, and he slung his gun over his back. It was their job to de-escalate. That was their mission with the locals. It's okay. Baker held his hands out to show that he wasn't a threat. We're not going to hurt you. She shook her head, lowering her knife hand to point at them. You try to take me back there and I swear to Christ, I'll leave you with something to remember me by, she warned, voice hoarse and fearful. We're not going to take you anywhere, Baker replied gently. You have my word. She took a deep, ragged breath, but didn't adjust her stance. 
How do I know you're not with Sean? Girl, we don't know who the fuck Sean is, Johnson cut in. Baker nodded. And there's no way in hell we'd ever hurt someone like you've been hurt. He inclined his head towards her, and she absently reached up to touch her cheek. The cut there looked fresh and deep. Her eyes brimmed with tears, glazing over as if she were reliving something horrific. Then the moment was over, and she blinked rapidly, swallowing hard. Bullshit, she rasped. We're in the middle of nowhere fucking Wyoming. You expect me to believe you guys just dropped in from the air? Baker shrugged. We came in from the railroad, actually, he explained, lowering his hands. We're on a mission to clear a path from Kansas to the northwest so we can move our troops there. She sucked in a breath and seemed to contemplate their story. After what felt like forever, she finally lowered her weapon, shoulders relaxing a little. My name's Linda, she said, still eyeing them warily. Okay, Linda, Baker offered a smile. I'm Private Baker, this is Private Johnson. His companion offered a little salute, and she inclined her head in his direction. Well, now that we got the pleasantries out of the way, can you tell us what in the holy hell is going on around here? Johnson asked, waving a hand around his head and then drawing his finger down his cheek. Who did that to you? She took another deep breath and let it out shakily before she leaned against the wall, avoiding their gazes. The zombie outbreak didn't hit us too hard, she began. We're pretty detached from civilization out here, so by the time people started getting sick, we were getting word of what was happening to them. Families that were healthy packed up and headed to Pine Haven at the reservoir up north, thinking they'd have a better chance at surviving with easy access to water. A small group of us decided to stay and defend the town. We went door to door during those first couple of days and secured all the sick people, old and young alike, made sure they were locked away and couldn't do any harm when they turned. Our hope was that we could secure the town and ride it out until help came, but it never did. After the television and the radio went dark, some people started to panic. That's when Sean happened. She stopped, pursing her lips and blinking rapidly. Johnson clenched a fist. Who the fuck is this asshole? He's the town's golden boy. Linda spat the words. Star football player that got recruited to play for the state university. He did okay for them, but wasn't spectacular. So after college, he came back to town where he could be a big fish in a small pond. He holds a lot of sway around here, even 10 years after his playing heyday. He was able to get a number of survivors to follow him, promising to lead this town into a new era, but it would only work if they listened to him. Baker wrinkled his nose. And people bought that line of bullshit? It's a bunch of small town guys who had their pinnacle moment in life playing high school football, she explained. It didn't take long for them to do his bidding and it got dark pretty fucking quickly. Johnson drew his bottom lip between his teeth. Is that how you got that? He asked, jutting out his chin towards her face. Linda swallowed hard, nodding jerkily. Sean realized pretty quickly that a lot of his followers had, um, needs. She looked at the ceiling, blinking a few times and clenching a fist. Thanks to the way the virus spread, the town's demographics were a bit skewed. Not in their favor. There were five of us who were attacked and locked up in the school. They treated us like their own personal harem, having their way with us whenever they wanted. I didn't take too kindly to it and fought back. She pointed to her face. I ended up a little worse for wear, but you should see the other guy. A bewildered laugh tore its way out of her throat, and she put a hand to her forehead. Johnson shook his head, face pale. How long have you been out here? he asked. Two nights now, she replied. This is such a small town, Baker pointed out. How have you stayed hidden? Have they not been looking for you? Oh, they send out patrols every now and then, especially at night, Linda explained. But I found the only safe space in town. She raised her chin at their blank expressions. You want me to show you? They both nodded, stepping out of the way. She slipped past them, and they noticed that she was careful not to brush either of them on her way by. They kept a respectful distance from her, not wanting to cramp her personal space, especially given everything she'd been through. Linda led them straight to the church, where they'd originally been headed, and stopped at the front door. You may want to cover your noses, 
she warned, and then turned the knob. The privates each raised their arms, hiding in the crooks of their elbows. But as soon as she opened the door, they both gagged at the putrid smell that hit them. Baker leaned over the stone siding to dry heave, and Johnson frantically pulled a bandana from his pocket and tied it tightly around his face. The entire main floor of the church was stacked at least six dead bodies high, all genders and shapes and sizes, some rotting worse than others. What in the holy goddamn fucking shit is that? Johnson gasped, motioning for her to close the door. Linda pulled it shut, cutting off the smell, but the soldiers couldn't seem to shake it from their nostrils. That's Sean's idea of preserving the town, she said bitterly. A lot of the people in there were sick, but an awful lot of them weren't. When he realized that no help was coming and we had limited supplies, he decided that if you couldn't be useful, you didn't need to be living. Baker shook his head slowly, face still green. And you've been sleeping in there? Yep, she replied. I figured it was the one place his boys wouldn't think to look for me. Get on the line with Sarge, Johnson instructed, pulling off his bandana and fanning the air in front of his face. Tell him we've got trouble. Baker nodded and pulled out his radio. On it. You have more people with you? Linda furrowed her brow. Yeah, a couple explore in the west side of town, and we got a couple of people at a house across from the high school, Johnson explained. Her eyes went wide, and she lashed out to grab his arm. The high school? She demanded. You gotta get them out now. That's where Sean is. Baker? Johnson barked, and his companion nodded firmly. Sarge? Sarge, do you read? He yelled into the radio. There was a tense moment of silence before a crackle responded from the other end. Yeah, I'm here. What is it? Hostiles in the school. Chapter 8 Kersey darted through the house, pulling all the curtains and securing every window. Kowalski ducked down below the front bay window, keeping his scope on the school. He cursed under his breath, and the sergeant skidded up next to him. How are we looking? he asked. The private shook his head. Got two on the roof that look trigger happy. Can you hit them? Kersey raised an eyebrow. Kowalski shrugged. Let me see. He pulled the little string on the blinds to raise them a few inches, and there was the instant crackle of gunfire. The window exploded, and the two soldiers ducked, covering their heads as glass rained down on them, and the blinds blew clear off of the wall. The silence afterwards was deafening, and Kersey lowered his arm slowly. Kowalski? Yeah, I'm good, the private grunted. But to answer your earlier question, no, I can't hit him at the moment. Fuck. Kersey let out a deep whoosh of breath. Keep an eye on him. He crawled away from the window and then jumped to his feet in the hallway, heading into the master bedroom. He grabbed Bill's arm and jerked him from the bed onto the floor, startling the poor engineer into sudden wakefulness. What? Bill moaned as his ass hit the hardwood. You know, you could just wake me up with a light tap or breakfast. He yanked his arm out of the sergeant's grasp. We're in trouble, Kersey snapped. Bill blinked away the sleep, suddenly wide awake as adrenaline began to pump. What's happening? Pretty sure the school is filled with people who want to murder us, the sergeant explained. Bill's eyes flicked to the ceiling for a beat, and then back again. Oh, so just your average Tuesday. Fantastic. Kersey stayed low as he moved under the window, and then threw open the closet. Other than a few old flowered dresses in the corner and a few old musty filing boxes, there wasn't anything else to be found. He knocked on the interior wood paneling, moving across until there was a hollow echo. Over here, he demanded, and then used the butt of his rifle to smash in the paneling. There was a crack, and he dug his hand in, prying apart a few chunks of wood to create a space wide enough for a person to squeeze through. Bill blinked at the dark crawl space. You want me in there? Yep, Kersey replied with a firm nod. I need you to stay in there until one of the others comes and gets you out. You don't make a sound. We don't know what these guys are capable of, but based on the panic in Baker's voice, I'm thinking it's bad. The engineer nodded and shimmied his way in. Stay safe, Sarge, he said somberly, and Kersey nodded his thanks before shoving the panels back into place. 
He pulled the hanging dresses over to cover the worst of the damage, and then closed the closet door. He hit the deck back in the hallway and crawled up beside Kowalski again. How we looking? Tried to keep an eye on them, but I don't have much of a view, the private admitted. Pretty sure I caught a glimpse of some of them moving around to the back. The sergeant nodded and crawled back down the hallway to the kitchen. He peeked up over the sink and sighed at the sight of six armed men darting across the backyard, taking cover behind the shed and an old car. Got company out back, Kersey called quietly. Kowalski leaned into the hallway. How bad? Pretty fucking bad, the sergeant replied, noting the assault rifles. Is going out the front door an option? The private pursed his lips and then noticed a bike helmet hanging next to the front door. He grabbed it and balanced it on the barrel of his rifle, slowly moving it up into the broken window. As soon as it crossed the threshold, a single shot rang out, and the helmet exploded into tiny bits of sparkly plastic and styrofoam. Not unless we want to get shot in the face, Kowalski confirmed. Looks like these boys on the roof can shoot. Kersey shook his head. Options? Call in an airstrike? the private asked. The sergeant couldn't help but laugh. Don't think General Stevens will approve that. Well, we have reinforcements in town, Kowalski pointed out. Let's just start shooting and get them up here. Negative, Kersey shook his head. We do that and we run the risk of Bill getting shot. Keeping him safe is the most important thing. Glad you're so concerned about us getting shot, Kowalski retorted. Whoever you are, a loud bellow sounded from the backyard and the sergeant peeked to see an athletic-looking blonde man in his early thirties step out from behind the shed. You are not welcome here. Kersey ducked behind the counter, his back against the cupboards, and shimmied over to the screen door. Don't mind us, he hollered back. We're just passing through. Passing through? The man asked. Who are you? I'm Sergeant John Kersey, and my friend up front is Private Kowalski, Kersey called out. We're on a field trip to the Northwest and stopped in your fine town for a bit of R&R. &R. Military boys, huh? The guy asked, sounding thoughtful. Well, looks like I might have a use for you other than stringing you up and feeding you to my pets. Well, we certainly appreciate not being zombie chow, the sergeant replied. We really do need to be on our way. Nonsense, there's no rush, the man replied, and the firm tone of his voice left no room for argument. You boys are gonna be my guests for a few days. Kersey took a deep breath. That's very generous of you, and we are very appreciative of the offer, but we really do need to get back on the road. This is not a request, Sergeant, the man declared. You boys are the meal ticket we've been waiting on. If y'all are way up in these parts, coming in via a locomotive, that tells me the military values your service. As a result, I have a feeling they're going to be more than happy to guarantee your safety by providing us with some supplies. The sergeant couldn't help but laugh. Your plan is to demand a ransom from the US military in a time of war? You haven't really thought that plan through very well, have you? Thanks to their negligence, the man growled. We've been backed into a bit of a corner here. See, we don't have the resources to grow our own food. Our supplier up the road in Gillette has been knocked out. So all we have is what we had left when this shit storm began, which isn't a whole lot. And despite paying my taxes six out of the last 10 years, I'm not seeing any return of that from the government. But with you boys here, I figure that's about to change. Kersey rolled his eyes. So what, you wanna give us a nice comfy room? We'll call it in and then wait for some food to get delivered? That sound about right? It does indeed, the man replied, sounding rather pleased with himself. So why don't y'all just come on out of there? Just leave your guns in the kitchen, and some of my boys will take real good care of them. Kowalski crawled into the kitchen, shaking his head vehemently. The sergeant nodded slowly at him, and the private scowled his defeat. He shoved his rifle across the tile floor and slowly got to his feet. All right, we're coming out, Kersey called and put down his own gun. He clapped his companion on the back, and they both raised their hands, moving slowly out the screen door. Several men descended on them quickly, patting them down to secure the prisoners. Which one of you is the sergeant I was speaking with? The blonde man asked, and Kersey inclined his head. Well, it's nice to meet you, sergeant. My name is Sean. Welcome to my humble little town. He spread his arms and grinned, pausing for dramatic effect. Then he raised a finger and waved to his men. Take them to detention. 
If I had a dollar for every time I've heard that, I could have retired instead of joining the military, Kowalski muttered. Sean chuckled. You and me both, friend, you and me both. He inspected the soldiers' bound hands, making sure they were secure behind their backs. Once you have them locked down, send out a patrol for their friends who are wandering around town. Tell the patrol that if they find resistance, they have permission to shoot on sight. He stared down his nose at the soldiers, whose faces had drained of all color. We have what we need to make a deal. Chapter 9 Mason growled under his breath as he watched a group of armed men lead their bound sergeant and Kowalski across the street towards the school. Settle down, Brett said quietly, putting a hand on his partner's shoulder. We've got to go get them, Mason protested, whirling on the corporal. They'd found an empty house adjacent to the school, having managed to take refuge before the shooters from the roof started scoping out the area. God only knows what they're going to do to them. They can handle themselves for the time being, Brett said calmly. We've got to figure out a way to get into that house undetected. The private threw up his hands. Why? Because Bill isn't being frog-marched to the school, the corporal explained. Which means he's either dead and we're truly fucked, or he's still hiding in there. He's the priority, unless you've magically learned how trains operate. Mason sighed his defeat, shoulders slumping. What's the play? First things first, we need to make sure that Johnson and Baker are still rolling, Brett said and unclipped his walkie-talkie from his belt. He changed the frequency and hit the button. Johnson, Baker, you boys there? Brett's we got hostiles in town. Baker came back immediately. Yeah, thanks for the warning on that one, the corporal replied, voice thick with sarcasm. Sorry, Sarge was priority since he was with Bill. The private gushed. Kidding, man, you did the right thing, Brett's assured him. Where are you boys at? Baker asked. Brett's took a deep breath. We're a block away from the school. Just saw Sarge and Kowalski being marched over from the house by some armed douchebags. Fuck, the private replied hoarsely. And Bill? No sight of him, Brett said. We're hoping he's still in the house. When you get him, you all make your way north, Baker instructed. There's a church that's up. Hang on, Linda, what road is that? There was a pause, and the corporal furrowed his brow at the radio, wondering who the hell Linda was. It's straight up Carver Avenue. Just for the love of God, don't go inside. We'll be in the last house on the left. Understood, Bretts replied. We'll see you soon, over and out. He clipped the walkie-talkie back to his belt and then turned to peer out the window again. The guards had retreated into the building, but there were still two snipers hanging out on the roof. Bretts sighed. Looks like we're going to have to take the long way around to the house. After ducking in and out of houses throughout the suburb, the two soldiers brought up the rear of the house. They knelt behind an old muscle car, clearly someone's restoration project, considering it was up on blocks with the engine half-built. Brett's peeked up over the trunk, narrowing his eyes to look for movement inside. He saw a few silhouettes moving around past windows and ducked back down quickly. He drew his knife and turned to Mason, putting a finger to his lips and then drawing it across his throat. His companion nodded in understanding, drawing his own blade. Bratz peered around the back of the car, watching the windows for an opportunity to move. When he dashed forward, Mason followed close behind, and they silently pressed themselves against either side of the back screen door. Bratz quietly pulled it open, waving the private in and gently closing it behind them to keep quiet. Man, can you believe the nerve of these soldier boys? A guy was saying his voice echoing from the living room, coming into our town thinking they're hot shit. Sean's gonna learn him some manners, I can tell you that, another guy replied, sounding closer to the master bedroom. Brett's motioned for Mason to head towards the living room and then move down the hallway towards the other. The private moved deliberately and slowly towards the sound of rummaging and saw the back of a guy as he dug around in the closet on the far end. Mason crept forward, and as soon as his opponent backed out of the closet, he lashed forward and planted the knife directly into his jugular. The private clapped a hand over his victim's mouth, silencing him as the life drained from his eyes, body falling limp back into the closet. Mason clenched his jaw, hating that the apocalypse had brought out the worst in humans. He hadn't wanted to stab a man to death today, but he had a mission. 
Man, I can't find shit back here. If they had somebody else, they're gone now, the other guy called. Yo, did you hear me? Bratz pressed himself against the wall around the corner from the end of the hallway as the footsteps got closer. God damn it, stop slacking off. The guy stomped into the living room and froze at the sight of his dead friend. The corporal took the opportunity to curl his arm around and stab him in the eye, burying the blade deep into his brain. The guard didn't even make a noise as his body slid to the floor. Mason knelt and stabbed his own corpse in the head to prevent reanimation, shaking his head once again at what he'd had to do. Bill, Bratz called. Bill, you here, buddy? He waited a moment, and there was no response. Check everywhere, the corporal instructed, and they split up, searching every room. Bratz entered the master bedroom, noting the rumpled covers. Bill? Knock, knock. The corporal furrowed his brow at the noise and opened the closet door. Bill? I'm in the wall. The engineer's voice was muffled. Bratz moved the set of floral dresses out of the way, noting the damaged wall panel. He dug his fingers into the top corner and tore it down, raising an eyebrow at the sight of his haggard and dusty companion. That's one hell of a hiding spot, he said. Bill coughed. You're telling me. Come on, we've got to get the hell out of here, Bratz instructed, holding the wood out of the way. It's not safe. Bill rolled his eyes. Yeah, no shit. Chapter 10 Sean led the way down a long series of hallways, the two soldiers keeping pace with armed men at their backs. The school was an absolute mess. There was trash everywhere, doors hanging off their hinges, and spray paint covering almost every surface they passed. Lockers, tiled floor, ceiling, a plethora of colors depicting a logo that neither of the prisoners could quite make out. Man, nice place y'all got here, Kowalski drawled as he trampled a crumpled up chip bag. Do you start the tour off with the best, or do we still have something to look forward to? Sean glanced over his shoulder as he walked. You have quite the mouth on you. Bet you hear that a lot from your buddies in the locker room. The private shot back with a wolfish grin. The blonde leader narrowed his eyes and spun around. He inclined his head away from the stairwell and motioned to the hallway to the left. You know, I think you boys would benefit from having the full tour. Let's go to the gym. Kersey shook his head at his companion as they followed Sean to a set of double doors. The muffled sound of heavy bass intensified as he threw them open, shredding metal music, blaring and echoing. The graffiti was a lot more concentrated in there, with makeshift barricades and social areas built around out of broken desks and overturned lockers. In the far corner, there was a crude cage put together out of chunks of the bleachers, a group of terrified-looking people inside. In the center circle was a thick, knotted rope, dangling all the way to the floor, surrounded by an eight-foot-tall fence. Out the side was a long, narrow fence hallway that led all the way to another set of double doors. What kind of host would I be if I didn't show you our main entertainment attraction? Sean sneered and whistled loudly as they reached the center pen. A few guards standing by the prisoners looked at him, and he raised a finger, prompting them to open the pen aiming their guns at the terrified residents. None of them looked to be in particularly good shape. Get your ass out of there. One of the guards reached in to grab a balding, middle-aged man that looked about 40 pounds overweight. No, please, he begged as he stumbled out of the pen. Don't make me climb. One of the guards kicked him in the ass, sending him sprawling to the floor. Oh yeah, there is no way in hell this guy is gonna last long. If he makes it to the third knot, I'll be surprised. The first guard replied, grabbing the man's collar and jerking him up to his feet. The second guard shook his head as he grabbed one of the prisoner's arms, and they began to drag him along. Nah, man, look at the fear in his eyes. He laughed cruelly. That alone will get him at least to the fourth one. Want to bet? The first guard grinned. Please, the prisoner moaned. The second guard shoved him against the fence hallway. Pack of smokes? he asked, ignoring the pleas of their victim. You're on, the first guard replied, and opened a door into the fence hallway. Oh my God, please, the man blubbered, gripping his new prison with panicked eyes. Please, Sean, no, don't do this. The blonde cocked his head, feigning sympathy. Shh, it's going to be okay, he cooed. 
You know the rules. You have the same chance as everybody else. The man broke down into full sobs, sagging against the fence. Please, no. Three minutes, Sean declared. That's all you have to do is last three minutes. What the fuck? This is sick, Kowalski muttered, and Kersey shook his head, prompting him to stay quiet. The sergeant knew there was no stopping this at this point. He raised his hand to a guard at the far end of the fence hallway, and his lackey pulled on a chain, opening the side doors. Moans immediately joined the guitar solo, and the man backed up against the closed gate to the rope pen. Oh God, open it, let me in, he begged. Open the gate. Now, now, Sean purred, as half a dozen zombies ambled into the gym, stumbling down the fence hallway. Ask nicely. Please, please open it, the man screamed. The blonde maniac cocked his head, putting a finger to his chin as if in thought. Well, okay, since you asked nicely, he motioned to another guard. Open it. One of the guards who'd made the bet pulled on a chain next to the rope pen, allowing the prisoner access. The rotund man rushed for the rope and quickly wiped his sweaty hands on his tattered pants. He gripped it tightly, struggling to pull himself up, sweat already beating on his red face as he looked over his shoulder at the corpses a mere ten yards away. Come on, man, Kowalski cried, stepping towards the rope pen. Just take deep breaths and concentrate, you can do it. The man turned his panicked eyes on the bound soldier and then followed his instructions, taking a deep breath and securing his feet on the first knot. Fall, you fat sack of shit, one of the betting guards yelled. I got smokes riding on this. The prisoner grunted and gripped the third knot, pressing his feet together on the second, and managed to reach up to grip the fourth in a desperate fist. God damn it, the guard snapped and pulled out a pack of smokes from his pocket before tossing it over to his buddy. Nice doing business with you, his companion replied with a wink. The other guard scowled. Fuck you, he snapped. Two minutes, Sean declared as the zombies reached up to brush the bottoms of the prisoner's shoes. He shrieked and managed to get up another rung, safely out of reach. But his breathing was heavy, and he looked like he was struggling to stay up there. Come on, buddy, you got this, Kowalski urged, desperation in his voice. Kersey remained silent, using the distraction to survey the room. There had to be something they could use to their advantage. One more minute, Sean said in a sing-song voice. Kowalski nodded. Yeah, that's right, buddy, you can do this. One more minute. The prisoner looked like he was about to pass out, the exertion of holding himself up there too much for his aging body. Several of the guards began chanting, fall, 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 but he held on, crying with the effort. And time, Sean said, sounding almost disappointed, and one of the guards reached up with a long cane to pull the rope against the top of the pen. As soon as his legs hit the fence, the prisoner let go and flopped down onto the gym floor with a scream upon impact. Kowalski knelt next to him, wishing he could help him up without his hands tied behind his back. That was a hell of a show, buddy, he said emphatically. You pissed off a lot of people, I'm proud of you. The man nodded, gasping for air. Thanks, he rasped. Take him back with the others, Sean snapped, and two guards dragged the poor prisoner back to the pen. Kowalski got back to his feet as the blonde led his captive sergeant over. You assholes really need to get laid, the private grunted. Sean grinned. I don't worry, we do. Guess I wasn't that far off with the mouth comment then. Kowalski shot back. Oh, we have women, the blonde chuckled. They're just secure. The soldiers paled and exchanged a disgusted look. Who knows, Sean continued, waving at a set of guards. If you're nice, I just might let you visit the Pleasure Palace before turning you over to your superiors. No thanks, Kowalski snapped, as an armed guy roughly grabbed the back of his collar. I prefer the old-fashioned way of winning the attention of a woman. Suit yourself. Sean shrugged and whirled on his heel, heading back to the stairwell they'd originally been aiming for before their little detour to the gymnasium. At the top of the stairs, there was a classroom door with a padlock on the outside, and a crude sign made out of cardboard that read, Pleasure Palace. Kowalski clenched his jaw at the sound of sobbing emanating from within. A few doors down, Sean stopped 
and the guards shoved the soldiers into the detention hall. It's not much, but this should keep you comfortable while we run down to storage and secure some communication equipment, the blonde explained. Kersey rolled his eyes. So you just expect me to call my SO and tell him to bring up some food so we can continue on our mission? Pretty much, yep, Sean replied with a nod, crossing his arms. It's not gonna work, the sergeant assured him. But you do you, man. Sean chuckled, shaking his head. We'll see, soldier boy. He slammed the door, and there was a dull thunk as they locked it from the outside. Kowalski immediately went over to the window, shoving open the shutter with his shoulder to find bars on the outside. You would think with this much open real estate, they would have thought to build on the right side of the tracks. Who knows, maybe they did, Kersey replied with a sigh. Sarge, how in the hell did things get fucked up this quickly? The private demanded, shoving against the shutters in anger. I mean, it's only been a week and a half, and these assholes have gone full-on Lord of the Flies cosplay, complete with murder games and a goddamn rape room. Is this what this country is now? Nah, these guys aren't the norm, the sergeant assured him. Still plenty of good people out there, and once we give them a place to go and a way to get there, we're gonna rebuild. Kowalski rested his forehead against the dusty window in defeat. I sure hope you're right, Sarge. I sure hope you're right. Chapter 11 Brats and Mason tore out of the church, the former dry heaving over his own shoes, and the latter full-on spewing over the side railing. Bill stood at the bottom of the steps, not having wanted to go inside to look. He plugged his nose with his hand as the putrid smell wafted from the door opening and slamming shut. Told you that you didn't want to see what was in there, Linda said, arms crossed and foot tapping. Yeah, well, be happy that we did, because now we're pissed, Brett said as he straightened up. We're going to take these motherfuckers out. Come on, let's get back to the house. She waved for them to follow her, glancing up and down the street. It's not safe out in the open, especially now that Sean knows you're here. Agreed, the corporal said, and motioned for the young woman to lead the way. He ushered Bill ahead of him, he and Mason bringing up the rear. Told you these boys are fucked up, Johnson declared from the couch as the quartet entered the house. Mason shook his head, still a little green. Yeah, I could have went without ever seeing that. So what's the play, Baker piped up, leaning forward in his seat. Bratz took a deep breath. Don't know yet. They've got snipers on the roof, and God only knows how many armed men inside. Not sure we're going to have the firepower to take them out. Linda, are there any places in town where we might be able to find some ammo? Baker asked. She shrugged and crossed her arms again, taking a seat by the door. Not that I'm aware of. They did a pretty good job of clearing everything out, at least on this side of town. What about the hotel by the diner? Mason snapped his fingers. Linda's brow furrowed. What about it? Well, the doors were shut and there were a mess of zombies tied up outside of the place, the private replied. It's like they were guarding it. It wasn't like that the last time I went by there, she mused. Granted, that was before they, she swallowed hard, before they forced me to be their guest. Bratz and Mason shared a puzzled look, but then it dawned on them why she was beaten up in a way that looked a lot more calculated than just random apocalypse scrapes. The corporal clenched a fist. Oh, we are definitely taking these assholes out, he growled. Will anybody here know how to pick a lock? Bill asked flopping down on the couch and wincing as his kneecaps crackled. Johnson raised his hand. My sister kept losing her keys, so she'd call me to come let her into the house whenever it had happened, he piped up. I kept telling her to just give me a spare, but she said she didn't feel comfortable knowing there was another key out there. There was an awkward moment of silence as the group stared blankly at the private. Yeah, I know, she wasn't the brightest bulb in the pumpkin patch, he said, waving them off. Lucky for her, she was a prom queen and had her a sugar daddy by the time she walked across the stage for graduation. Bratz rubbed his forehead. For future reference, a simple yes will suffice in the future. What can I say? Johnson grinned. I'm colorful. All right, the corporal continued. Here's what we're going to do. Mason, I want you to take Bill back to the train. You sit tight and stay quiet. If there's trouble, reverse course. If you don't hear from us by sunrise, y'all continue on without us. Yes, sir, Mason confirmed. 
Brett's glanced around the rest of the room. As for all of us, we're going to figure out what's inside that hotel. If they're protecting something that much, it has to be something valuable. As Mason and Bill stepped towards the front door, the private grabbed the engineer and jerked him back, dragging him back into the living room. There's a patrol, he said quickly, and everyone leapt to action. A trio of armed men approached the house, sawed off shotguns at the ready. Fan out, boys, the lead one declared as they entered the front hall. I'll take the living room. The front door was shut, so somebody's been up here. He parted from his companions and moved slowly up the hallway, heading into the living room. A shit-eating grin broke out over his face at the sight of Linda's slender frame on the couch with her back turned to him. Oh, there's that pretty young thing I like so much, he drawled, licking his lips. You ready to come home to daddy, little girl? She's not going anywhere with you, Brett said, voice ice cold, as he pressed the barrel of his assault rifle against the back of the guy's neck. Linda sat up, curling her knees into her chest and watching with wide eyes as the scene in front of her unfolded. Boy, you see this here shotgun? The intruder sneered. With this spread, it's gonna turn you and everything around you into Swiss goddamn cheese. That's cute that you think you can do a 45-degree turn, aim, and fire in the time it would take me to pull the trigger, the corporal said. The guy chewed his bottom lip, his trigger finger twitching a bit. Hey, maybe you're right, maybe I'm right. Well, you know, maybe we both just need to kick it down a notch, talk about things instead of being in a Mexican standoff. Talk about things, huh? Brett's asked, rolling his eyes. Why so chatty all of a sudden? Is it because you think your boys are gonna come save the day? As if on cue, the other two intruders appeared in the other doorway. They entered, flanked by soldiers, who kicked their knees out from behind them. So here's what's gonna happen, Bretz continued. You move, I'm gonna shoot you. My friend here is gonna come grab that shotgun, and you're gonna keep playing statue, we clear? His prisoner sighed. Yeah, we're clear. Johnson stepped forward and grabbed the shotgun, shoving it into the side pocket of his pants. Brett's moved around so he could look at him squarely. You did the smart thing there, the corporal said, cocking his head. Now I have a few. Linda leapt up from the couch and kicked the prisoner between his legs. He whimpered and dropped like a stone, rolling back and forth on his back. Oh, you fucking whore, he groaned. Well, I guess I'll ask my questions in a minute, Brett said, and took a step back to watch the show. Linda's eyes went maniacally wide, and she leaned over to undo the guy's belt. She tore open the gaudy American flag buckle and ripped the leather from the loops, and then straightened up, kicking him in the thigh. Roll over, George, she demanded, but he continued to writhe in pain on the floor. Roll the fuck over, fat man. He still didn't comply, and she brought her foot down hard on his crotch. Even through his protective hands, the force made him wretch with pain. Stop, please stop, he gasped. She stared down at him menacingly. Roll over. She raised her foot again and he complied, rolling onto his stomach. Linda leaned over and looped the belt around his neck, pulling it tight through the buckle to create a tight leash. He gagged as she jerked on it, gasping for air. She lowered her mouth next to his ear. You're my bitch now, she growled and then loosened the noose a bit to allow George a breath. She handed the belt over to Brett's. Hold this for a minute, please. The corporal took the belt in hand, staring down with amusement at his new prisoner. Linda walked over to the other two on their knees, leaning over to study each of their faces. She squinted as they sweat under her scrutiny, and finally she straightened up. Kill the one on the left, she demanded. The one on the right did us no harm. Oh God, please no. The one on the left begged, shaking his head frantically. I'm so sorry for what I did to you. Please, I don't want to die. Johnson pursed his lips and looked to Brett's with a questioning gaze. The corporal gave a little shrug, and his private swallowed hard. Ma'am? Johnson cleared his throat. I don't know if I feel comfortable. Do it, Linda snapped, or I'll do it my goddamn self. The prisoner burst into tears, honking sobs like a terrified goose. Johnson ran a hand through his hair, and the woman snarled, reaching over to grab the knife from his belt. He stared, dumbfounded, as she whipped around and got down on one knee, pressing the blade against her offender's throat. You know, I could make this nice and easy for you, 
Linda growled. Jab this into the right spot on your soft little neck and bleed you out real quick. Just a tiny little prick. She dropped the blade and tapped the flat of it against the front of his crotch. Kind of like you. She cocked her head, returning the knife back up to his cheek. But I think back to the times you visited me, how you didn't make it nice or easy for me. And when it was quick, you took your frustrations out on me. She reached up with her free hand and touched the still fresh wound on her cheek, baring her teeth in a soundless hiss. I think turnabout is fair play, don't you? He shook his head, still sobbing. No, please, no, I'm so sorry, I'm- She plunged the knife into his belly, right to the hilt, and he made a noise somewhere between a gag and a gasp. Blood gurgled in his throat, and he groaned as she twisted the blade, crimson running out over his chin. I'd love to keep this up and make you suffer for as long as humanly possible, Linda said, jerking the knife back and forth in his soft flesh. But my new friends and I have shit that needs to get done. She tore the blade hard to the right, slicing open his guts completely. The body flopped wetly to the floor, innards spilling out onto the carpet, twitching a few times as the life drained out of him. Linda wiped the blade clean on the back of his shirt and then stood staring down her nose at the dying man. She spit on him, saliva hitting him square in the forehead, and then turned to Johnson, holding out the knife. Thank you, she said. He shook his head and unclipped the sheath from his belt. Girl, you know how to use that thing better than I do. Why don't you hang on to it? Much appreciated, she replied, and graciously accepted the gift, clipping it to the waistband of her pants. She turned to the other prisoner, still on his knees, pale and fearful at the sight of his comrade's innards all over the floor. Don't worry, Linda continued. I'm not gonna hurt you. I remember the only time these assholes brought you to us. They tried to force you to partake, and you didn't. You actually had the balls to stand up to them and do what was right. I'm so sorry, he blurted, quiet tears spilling down his cheeks as he stared up at her. I wish I could have done more. I wish I could have stopped them. If you had tried, you would have ended up dead. She cut in, shaking her head. I'm not angry at you. However, I do have a question for you, and it's a real simple one. She paused for effect, bending down to stare at him. Are you with Sean, or are you with the rest of us? You get Sean out of the way, and I'll do whatever you want me to, he said immediately. She nodded, straightening back up. Good, now I don't want you to have any conflicting emotions. So we're gonna leave you tied up here nice and snug while we go take care of the Sean problem at the school. You okay with that? She waited for a nod and then cocked her head. I don't remember your name. Charlie, he replied just as quickly as before. She smiled. Okay, that's good, Charlie, that's good. We'll talk soon. She turned away from him and Baker and Johnson took him off to the back room to get him secured and comfortable. Linda stepped over to Brett's and took George's leash. He was much more terrified looking now, unsure of what his fate was going to be at the hands of the avenging angel. She jerked on the belt, causing him to gag and heel next to her. Mason, get Bill to the train and lay low, Brett's instructed after handing over the prisoner. Linda motioned back towards the church. There's an old four-wheeler path that starts about a 100 yards north of the church, she explained. It runs east, then south towards the tracks. It's a bit of a hike, but you shouldn't have to worry about any patrols. You up for a hike, Bill? Mason asked, rocking back and forth on his heels. Next time I say I can sleep on the train, Bill replied from his vantage point, leaning in the doorway. Y'all do me a favor and let me sleep on the goddamn train. I was supposed to be getting some rest, and now I'm going on a fucking nature hike. Linda shook her head and leaned over to the corporal. He's a surly one, isn't he? You have no idea, Bretz replied. I heard that, Bill called over his shoulder as he headed out with Mason, and there were chuckles all around. Bretz leaned down and pulled out a zip tie, securing George's hands behind his back. Linda yanked hard, choking him until he got to his feet, face red from lack of oxygen. Well, what do you say we take the new dog for a walk and head down to the hotel, she asked. See if we can't find out what's in there. The corporal bowed at the waist and motioned to the door with a flourish. Ladies first. Chapter 12 
Goddamn girl, he's up, I'm moving, George gasped, as Linda practically dragged him along the street, leading the trio of soldiers. She narrowed her eyes and tightened the noose briefly to remind him who was in charge. You'll speak when spoken to, she snapped. She let off a little bit and he coughed. They reached the parking lot of the hotel, leaving a wide berth from the eight chained zombies in case one of them got loose. They'd been secured with four in the front and four on shorter chains in the back, giving a double line of defense. Bratz furrowed his brow. Well, ideas? Baker scratched the side of his face and walked across to one side of the little horde, stepping closer than his group. He jumped up and down, and they quickly moved over to him, grabbing at the end of their tethers. Is there enough room to sneak through behind them now? The private asked. Johnson snorted. You? If you're up for it, me, not a chance in fucking hell. He put up his hands. I don't want to be zombie chow. We could just shoot him, Baker shrugged. No, we've got to do this quiet, Brett said. I don't want to get into a firefight with these assholes until it's on our terms. Johnson sighed. So you want to knife him? I don't really see any other way. The corporal confirmed with a shrug. Do you? Baker pulled out his knife and stepped forward, trying to line up a shot to deliver a blow to a nearby corpse head. As he inched forward, one of the zombies knocked over another and snapped at him. He leapt back, stumbling and ending up on his ass on the pavement. Fuck. You all right? Johnson asked. Yeah. Baker assured him as he got back to his feet. But that is not a viable plan. Way too fucking risky. Johnson motioned over his shoulder. Maybe we can find something useful in the diner, he suggested. Metal post or something? Mason and I were in there earlier, Bretts put in, shaking his head. It was gutted. Baker sighed. Do we really need to get in there? They're protecting it for a reason, Johnson insisted. Linda rolled her eyes at the back and forth and gave George a shove forward. It dawned on him what she was doing, and he dug in his heels, pushing back against her. No, fuck no, he begged. She grunted with the effort of pushing against his large frame. Hard way it is then, she warned, and reached down to grab his balls in her tiny fist. He shrieked, and she used the distraction to shove him closer to the horde. Don't, you fucking bitch, don't, George screamed and the zombies perked right up, ready for their meal. Linda gave him one last hard shove, and he staggered into the group of corpses. He tried to roll away, but they immediately tore into his legs, dragging him down to the asphalt. The soldiers stared in shock, watching the screaming man struggle under gnawing teeth. Are you waiting for an invitation? Linda snapped. Bratz and Baker shook their heads and leapt into action, quickly stabbing the backs of as many heads as possible as they fed on their fresh meat. The whole ordeal took less than a minute, all of the zombies dispatched, while George moaned and bled out on the asphalt. Linda stepped forward, staring down at him with icy eyes. These guys really hurt you, didn't they? Bratz asked quietly. She jutted out her chin. You have no idea. She pulled out her new knife and plunged it down into George's forehead, preventing reanimation and helping to get her revenge all in one fell swoop. She turned away to clean the blade and sheathe it, taking a deep breath to steady her racing heartbeat. Johnson, you're up, the corporal said, stepping aside. Johnson nodded and clambered over the pile of bodies, making quick work of picking the lock. The door opened a hair and he stepped back, readying his gun as Bretts began a silent countdown to breach the door. The corporal reached zero and burst inside, flanked by the other two soldiers, Linda bringing up the rear. There was no noise inside, but it was very dark. Baker, hit the blinds, Brett said. Let's see what we have. The private felt along the wall and opened the blinds, letting light bathe the hotel lobby. The quartet blinked at the piles and piles of blankets and clothing filling the place, with only a few narrow pathways heading through. Christ. Johnson breathed. It's Hoarder's Wyoming edition. Bratz shook his head, reaching over to flip a button-down shirt over in his hand. This explains why everywhere we went, we couldn't find anything of value. What's it all doing here, though? Baker asked with a shrug. I thought they were up at the high school. Linda took a deep breath. 
Sean is a bit of a control freak, so this isn't a surprise, she explained. This is probably his rainy day supply cache, so when things get low, he can just off everybody and live comfortably for a while. What a charmer, Johnson muttered. Bet he's fun at parties. Well, if I get my way, he's going to be the guest of honor at the party I throw, Linda said, selecting a red fitted t-shirt from one of the piles to replace her tattered tank top. Pretty sure if we dig, we'll find some party favors in here, Johnson suggested. Bratz nodded. Look around for anything useful, guns, ammo. A hunting rifle would go a long way towards taking out those snipers on the roof. They spread out, digging through the piles of fabric. Baker lifted a cast iron pan from beneath a pair of khakis, shaking his head. Man, you'd think in a rural town like this, there would be plenty of hunters. Lots of elderly people here, Linda explained, as she emerged from behind a wall of junk wearing her new shirt. So probably not as many hunters as you'd think. The group here in town would go up to their cabins by the reservoir up north most weekends, so they probably kept the bulk of the weapons there. Johnson wrinkled his nose. Either that, or there's a goddamn arsenal at the high school. That too, she admitted. Brett's emerged from one of the back offices. Anybody got anything? He asked, and received a round of disappointed shaking heads. So now what? Baker asked. The corporal pursed his lips, contemplating. And then suddenly, his eyes lit up, a sly smile curling his mouth. Oh, hell, Johnson barked. Last time he had a look like that, I ended up getting chased through some Middle Eastern shitberg by a bunch of pissed off locals. Bratz ignored him. Linda, how bright is Sean? Um, the highlight of his life is catching a ball, she scoffed. You do the math. The corporal turned to Baker. When you were getting supplies back at base camp, did you pack any C4? Johnson threw up his hands. And there it is. Wait, wait, Linda cut in. Like explosive C4? You do realize I have to live in this town after we take Sean out, don't you? Bretz raised a finger in the universal sign of holding on. Just bear with me, please, he said, and turned back to Baker. The private nodded. Yeah, got C4, grenades. Pretty sure I picked up a grenade launcher or two. Christ, did you pick up stingers too? Johnson blurted. Baker shook his head. No, but I did look. Perfect, Brett said clapping his companion on the shoulder. I want you to go back to the train and grab some C4. Hell, pick up the grenades too, Johnson added. Could come in handy if we get pinned down. Bratz nodded. Yes, good idea. Johnson, I want you across the street on the roof to keep watch. If a patrol comes this way, take them out however you can. Once they see the pile of zombies outside, they're gonna know we're here. The soldiers saluted and headed off to follow their orders, fist bumping as they parted ways in the doorway. Linda tapped her foot, crossing her arms. So you want to tell me why you're going to blow up my town? Don't worry, the only thing I intend on blowing up is the abandoned diner in the parking lot, Bratz assured her. Her brow furrowed. What good is that going to do? Well, we don't have the numbers or the weaponry to do a full-scale assault on the school, the corporal explained. Our sniper is a prisoner there, which means we can't take down their shooters on the roof. We'd be cut down before we could even get to the front door. So we're going to have to bait Sean if we want to take him out. If he thinks we're going to blow up his stockpile, he'll negotiate with us for our buddies. That gets us close enough to the door to give us a fighting chance. If we can get inside, we'll cause a hell of a ruckus. Linda drew in a deep breath. Okay, she finally said. I trust you. Bratz pulled out his handgun and gave it a quick check. You know how to use one of these? He asked. Only fired one a couple of times, she admitted. I wasn't very good at it. Well, they don't know that, he replied, and held the gun out to her. If they see you pointing it in their direction, I guarantee they'll take cover. Could be useful. She took it gently and then offered him a smile. Thank you for helping me. It's why I became a soldier, Bretz replied. To help people. He paused, feeling like he might have put a reassuring hand on her shoulder, if not for her recent apocalypse experiences. Instead, he returned her smile. Don't worry, we'll get your town back. Chapter 13 Kowalski tossed another pencil up into the ceiling, wrinkling his nose as it bounced off and clattered to the floor. 
Oh, this takes me back. Spent a lot of time in detention, did you? Kersey asked, spinning the teacher's desk chair around a few times before turning towards his companion. They'd found a nail file in one of the desks and had taken care of their plastic bonds. The file had broken, but at least they had their hands to occupy themselves. Yeah, my sophomore year I was a little hellraiser, Kowalski admitted. Pretty sure I spent more time in here than in actual classes. He threw another pencil and it stuck fast, and he fist-pumped the air with a grunt of victory. Kersey raised an eyebrow, shaking his head. What? the private asked. It's the little things, Sarge. Kersey chuckled, but the moment was short-lived at the rattle of the padlock on the outside of the door. We have to buy as much time as we possibly can for Brett's to figure out how to get us out, the sergeant hissed quietly. Kowalski nodded. I can handle that. Just don't piss them off too much, Kersey warned. They need us alive, but I don't think they'd have any issues smacking us around. Kowalski just winked at his superior, and they both turned to the door as it opened. One of Sean's lackeys rolled in a metal cart with some giant ancient communication equipment that looked like some relic out of a museum. Sean strolled in, standing next to it, and waved a hand as if to present them with their prize. The soldiers looked at each other, and then back at the cart, and then burst out laughing. What in the hell do you want us to do with this thing? Kowalski gasped, wiping fake tears from his eyes. Call in an airstrike over Berlin? It's an old ham radio tech that one of our townsfolk upgraded to high frequency, Sean explained, crossing his arms. So if you wanted to, you could call Berlin, not just order an airstrike on them. Okay, fine, bring it over and let me see what I can do, Kersey said, and rolled around the teacher's desk to have a look at the machine. The lackey rolled the card over and plugged the radio into the large battery on the bottom. It whirred to life, giving off a low hum. Not often you can hear the radiation coursing through the air, Kowalski quipped, tossing another pencil at the ceiling and missing spectacularly. Kersey leaned over and began tuning the dials. So what do you think, Private? Who should we get in touch with? You need to get in touch with the decision maker, Sean declared. The sergeant rolled his eyes. That's great and all, but in case you haven't noticed, there's a bit of a nationwide issue going on. Dead rising and all? He waved his hand over his head. So if you want your ransom for us, we're going to have to contact who we think we can get a hold of. They can run it up the chain of command from there. The blonde huffed, but his shoulders relaxed. I don't know. Kowalski leaned back in the desk chair he perched in. What do you think, General Bretz? Kersey raised an eyebrow. General Bretz? I wasn't aware he had gotten a promotion. Yeah, field promotion, the private replied, nodding his head in seriousness. Very deserving if I say so myself. Okay, the sergeant agreed, stifling a smile. General Bretz it is. He dialed the radio to their emergency frequency and reduced the radius to just a few miles. He lifted the mouthpiece to his lips. Calling General Bretz, he said. This is Sergeant Kersey, over. He paused and waited, but there was just silence. General Bretz, this is Sergeant Kersey, do you copy? Where the fuck is he? Sean demanded, eyes narrowed with annoyance. Kersey waved him off. Give him a minute, he's a busy man. He'd better fucking hurry, Sean muttered, cracking his knuckles. Sergeant Kersey, this is General Bretz. The reply crackled over the old radio. Status report. Sir, we are currently at the high school in Moorcroft, Wyoming, Kersey explained calmly. In his best Stevens impression, Bretz replied, What in the hell are you doing there? Well, General, we stopped for supplies and ended up getting a little more than we bargained for, Kersey said. Explain yourself, Sergeant, Bretz exclaimed, and Kowalski coughed to stifle the laughter threatening to bubble up in his throat at how much fun it sounded like the corporal was having. We've been apprehended by the town's leader, a man named Sean, Kersey explained. He wishes to trade our freedom for supplies, food, water, the basics. Bretz clucked his tongue. So just so I understand the situation, you failed your mission by getting captured by a bunch of civilians who have decided to wage war against the United States of America? What? Sean blurted, eyes going wide. No, we're not waging war. We just want food. Kersey held up his hand to signal him to quiet down. General, I don't know if they've declared war on the nation, he began. 
Bullshit, Bratz barked. They kidnapped U.S. soldiers for their own selfish gains. And as you know, Sergeant, we don't negotiate with hostile forces, be they foreign or domestic. Since you have sensitive information that could be used against us, I'm afraid we're going to have to Ripley this situation. Sean gripped his hair in both hands. Ripley the situation? He cried. What the hell does that mean? It means they're going to nuke the site from orbit, Kersey said. The blonde's mouth opened and closed like a fish. What? They're going to nuke us? It's just a figure of speech, Kowalski cut in, struggling not to look extremely amused at the situation unfolding before him. It's more than likely just a barrage of Tomahawk missiles. Well, General, Kersey continued into the radio. What can I say? We had a good run. Had to come to an end at some point. Sean dove forward and snatched the mouthpiece from the sergeant's hand. Oh, General, don't blow us up, he begged. Please, we're sorry. We aren't waging war on the USA. After a few tense moments of silence, Bretts suddenly burst into laughter. Oh, stop shitting yourself, man. We're just fucking with you. Sean's eyes widened in realization, and as Kowalski dissolved into laughter, his eyes narrowed with menace. Do you think this is a fucking game? He growled into the radio. I will straight up murder your men. No, you won't, Bretts replied confidently. Oh, really? Sean sneered. Strong words from someone who doesn't have any cards to play. Why don't you come take a look out the window? The corporal asked. Sean shook his head. Hell no, I'm not stupid. Jury's still out on that one, Kowalski quipped. Relax, Sean, Bretts came through. Nobody is gonna take a shot at you. We're not going to risk our men's lives like that, especially when we know you're going to waltz them out the front door for us. The blonde chuckled, but it sounded forced. That would be one hell of a trick there, General. It's corporal, actually, Bretts replied, amusement in his tone. But the promotion was nice while it lasted. General, corporal, I don't really give a fuck, Sean snarled. You have ten seconds to give me a reason not to kill these two and send every man I have out to hunt you the fuck down. Bratt sobered quickly. Find a window and look to the west, he demanded. Sean grunted and waved at one of the guards to open the shutters on the west side of the room. What am I looking for, he asked. We found your hotel stash, Bretts replied, and then an explosion rocked the building. A fireball rocketed into the sky from the direction of the hotel, and as Sean regained his footing, he let out a loud roar. What the fuck? He screamed into the radio. I'm gonna kill you and everybody you know, starting with these two right here. Relax, that was the diner, the corporal said, as if placating a small child. What? Sean asked, bewildered as he scrubbed a hand down his face. The diner? Yeah, the diner in front of the hotel, Bretz explained. Just a warning shot, to let you know we weren't bluffing. The blonde growled in frustration and sat down on one of the desks. All right, he said finally. What do you want? We're going to be at the west side parking lot in 10 minutes, Brett said. I want your men off the roof, all the shutters closed, and you alone are going to escort the prisoners out to us. No, fuck that, Sean replied immediately. I'm not coming outside alone. You get what you want and then I'm dead. There was a pregnant pause before the corporal came back. Okay, you get two men by the entrance. And just so we're clear, we see movement on the roof, you die first. A shutter opens. You die first. Are we clear? Crystal, Sean growled into the radio, and then threw the receiver down in frustration. Fuck. Watch yourself there, Kowalski warned, a shit-eating grin on his face. Pretty sure there's going to be a shortage on high blood pressure meds. One more fucking word and I'll kill you on principle, Sean roared, turning to the private with fire in his eyes. He whirled towards his lackeys by the door. Get him ready to move. You two are with me outside. Make sure your boys on the roof know what the deal is. Tell them to stay out of sight until my signal. And get a couple of the men from the gym up here, too. I don't want these fuckers getting away with this. He kicked one of the desks with another scream and stalked out of the detention hall. Chapter 14 Looks like they're following our orders. Brett said quietly from their vantage point, behind two back-to-back -back cars about 20 yards from the school door. Baker peeked over the hood for a split second. Looks like it, he agreed. 
although I got ten to one odds that they have shooters ready to go. No doubt, the corporal agreed, which is why we gotta stay frosty. He nodded to Johnson, who grinned at him reassuringly. Linda kept her back to the car, controlling her breathing as she gripped the handle of her new knife. She closed her eyes at the sound of the building doors opening. Brett's watched as two armed men came out, guns raised. They took up positions behind a nearby car, exciting the zombies in the pen off to the side of the parking lot. They began to rattle the fence, as if building up a chair for the two soldiers, stepping out into the sunlight. Sean followed close behind, keeping his handgun firmly pressed against the back of Kowalski's head. Move it, you loudmouth piece of shit, he snapped, and then shoved him forward. As soon as they passed the car, the blonde ducked behind it where his guards were. Here you go, now get the fuck out of my town. Where are the rest of the prisoners? Bretts called out. Sean muttered something under his breath and then peeked up over the hood. What are you talking about? That is all of them. No, it's not, Linda shrieked and stood up fully, squaring her shoulders at her abuser. And you know it. Sean sighed and shook his head. I'm sorry, sweetheart, he said condescension dripping from his voice. But these two soldiers are the only ones leaving today. Kowalski and Kersey continued at a slow pace, not wanting to draw too much attention to themselves during the tense standoff. The excited zombie groans echoed on, accentuating the stare down between the woman and her former captor. That's not the deal, asshole, Linda snarled. Everybody gets free today. Why don't you sit back down, sweetheart, Sean sneered. The men are handling this. She clenched her jaw. Call me sweetheart one more time and see what happens, she warned. Oh, feisty, the blonde laughed heartily. I knew you were my favorite for a reason. Linda grabbed the handgun at her side, and Baker reached up to grab her wrist. Her face went white, and she tore her hand away from him, but got the message to keep herself in check. Sorry, he whispered after realizing he shouldn't have grabbed her. Sean stood up and raised his gun in the air. That's far enough, soldier boys, he called, and Kowalski and Kersey froze, about halfway across to safety. What's the problem, Bretts called. Thought we had a deal here. Well, your bitch there wanted to renegotiate, so we're going to renegotiate, Sean replied with an arrogant smirk. You don't get your men back until I get her. Not gonna happen, the corporal called back immediately. She's not going back in there. The blonde cocked his head. You really don't value your men's lives, do you, corporal? I promise you, I value their lives a whole hell of a lot more than I value yours, Bretts warned, voice like steel. I assure you that this is not a road you want to go down. Johnson narrowed his eyes at the sight of one of the shutters on the second floor, moving ever so slightly, and the glint off of the tip of a barrel in the sunlight. Contact, he yelled and leapt to his feet opening fire immediately on the threat. The shutters imploded, and the gun barrel disappeared inside. Linda took the opportunity to point her handgun at Sean and fire a few shots. She missed by a mile, but the offensive move sent him barreling back into the building to take cover. Kersey and Kowalski skidded around the two cars, having sprinted as soon as Johnson fired. Kowalski felt a hard impact on his back and flew to the asphalt, bringing his arms up just in time to break his fall. The sergeant cried out and grabbed him by the back of his vest, dragging him behind cover. Holy fuck, are you okay? He demanded. I am gonna kill the motherfucker who shot me, Kowalski snapped, clenching a fist. Kersey shook his arm. Are you okay? He asked firmly. Yeah, just caught my vest, the private assured him, shaking him off. Motherfucker. More guards came out of the woodwork in the school, opening fire on the soldiers ducked behind the cars in the parking lot. Shutters opened and snipers popped up on the roof, a few more guards bustling out the front doors and taking cover behind their own cars. Great plan, General, Kersey drawled, raising an eyebrow at his corporal. Brett shrugged. Hey, you're out, aren't you? He asked, holding out his handgun. We've got to fall back, Kowalski said as he took another handgun from Johnson. Hell no. Linda cried, slapping her hand on the side of the car in frustration. We're not leaving my people in there. Lady, we're pinned down, Kowalski argued, 
So unless you have a way to flank those ground shooters and keep them occupied long enough to take out the top shelf assholes, we need to fall back. She pursed her lips in response. That's what I thought, the private snapped. Linda glanced down at Baker's utility belt and snatched one of the grenades free. She held it up in front of Kowalski's face and pulled the pin out, giving him a wink before lobbing it over the car and straight towards the zombie pen. The grenade smacked into the brick wall of the school, skittering across the pavement to rest a few feet from the chain link. The guards barely had time to react before the explosion racked the battlefield, shrapnel flying in all directions. As the smoke cleared, everyone peeked up from their respective cover to see the zombie pen in tatters. Quite a few of the corpses that soaked up the blast painted the pavement and walls with rotted goo, but the remaining ones from the back flooded out into the parking lot. The guards ducked behind cars, screamed, and turned away from the soldiers, firing on the horde closing in on them. Many of them not being highly trained gunmen, they were unable to hit the zombies in the head and couldn't fell enough of them to protect themselves. Help us, help! One of them screeched up at the windows, but the angle was too hard for the second floor shooters to hit anything substantial. Two of the guards managed to make it to the front doors, but when they yanked on them, they realized they were locked. Sean had barred the door from the inside. They turned around just in time to meet the gnawing teeth of the rotted angels of death descending on them. Fuck this. Another guard threw his weapon and raised his hands, jumping out from behind his car. His partner followed suit, looking hopefully at the soldiers in hopes that they could surrender instead of facing such a grisly fate. The soldiers held their fire but one of the second-floor shooters obviously adjusted his aim down at the two defecting guards. Bretts and Baker spotted it and shot them, shredding the shutters on that window and destroying the position. The rest of the soldiers stood up to join, but all of the shooters on the roof had retreated back inside as well. Johnson and Kowalski dove out and grabbed the surrendering guards, shoving them back behind cover and pinning them face down on the pavement. It's real simple, boys. Kowalski grunted as he secured his prisoner's hands behind his back with zip ties. You stand up, we're gonna put you down. And if you think it's a good idea to go back on your surrender, just know that we're all about bullet conservation. So we'll feed you to those things rather than waste the ammo. We clear? The two bound guards nodded furiously, holding position and keeping their mouths shut with wide eyes. Johnson and Baker kept their guns focused on the second floor. Brett's focused on the roof. Linda and Kersey kept their eyes on the small horde, still clustered around the door and feasting on their now quiet meal. Looks like everybody retreated, Bretz mused. The sergeant turned to him. So what's your plan, General? He asked, unable to keep the playfulness out of his voice. You know, keep calling me that, and I'm going to assume it was a real promotion, the corporal teased. Kersey chuckled. We can't have that now, can we? So what's the layout like in there? Bretz asked, tone back to business. Long hallway when you get in, classrooms on either side, Kersey replied. Jim is on the left, and the stairs are straight ahead. The corporal sighed. So basically a shooting gallery, and we're the ducks. Pretty much, the sergeant agreed. Bretz pursed his lips. Any idea on numbers? At least five, based on who was shooting at us here, Kersey said. Kowalski shuffled up next to him. We saw at least a dozen or so armed men in the gym, too. Who knows how many more hostiles are in there? They aren't all hostile, Linda cut in. Kowalski gave her the side eye. They looked pretty fucking hostile to me. Don't get me wrong, some of them are. She put her hands up, palms out. But a lot of them are just afraid of Sean. You cross him and you get selected to play the rope game. Bratz furrowed his brow. The rope game? Gym class from hell, Kowalski explained. Fun, the corporal said flatly. Kersey sighed. So any ideas on how to get them not to shoot us? The principal's office is five doors up on the right, Linda suggested. If you get me to it, I could make an announcement that Sean's reign is at an end. How are you gonna do that, Johnson drawled. There's no power. It's an old school system on a battery backup, she explained. Also doubles as the town's tornado warning system, which is why they made it work without power. 
there were some fresh, excited groans as a few of the zombies finished their meal and turned towards the source of conversation in the parking lot. Baker, see what you can do about them, will you? Kersey asked. The private stopped his second floor sweep and drew a long knife from his belt. He kicked the first zombie in the chest, sending it tumbling back, and then slammed his blade into the second one's face. Before the first one could get back up, he descended on it and plunged the knife into the back of its skull. The noise unfortunately attracted a half dozen more of their friends, and Baker backed up. Shots coming, he warned. Just make them count, Kersey instructed. Baker sheathed his knife and drew his handgun, carefully lining up each shot, timing his breaths and steps backwards as he dropped each corpse. Falling into the zen state was almost peaceful, and dropping zombies that wanted to eat him was always a source of satisfaction in this cruel world. Well, I think we have us a plan, the sergeant declared, as his private came back around the car. Half of one at any rate, Brett's corrected. Not really looking forward to a run down a long hallway. Those assholes aren't the best shot in the West, but I'm betting they could hit us in that scenario. Kowalski glanced over at the remaining zombies approaching and tapped Baker on the shoulder as he began to take them out as well. Hey, make sure you leave one of them alive. I have an idea. Do I want to know? Baker asked. Kowalski grinned. Probably not. Well, he might not want to know, but I sure as hell do. Kersey piped up. This thing is dinged up and probably isn't going to stop another shot in the back, Kowalski said as he unclipped his bulletproof vest. I figure if we put it on one of those dead fuckers, we can use them to lead the charge, get some good use out of it. Brett shrugged. Guess it won't really matter if a bullet cracks through it, he agreed. And frankly, if one of those boys manages to land a shot that goes through two Kevlar panels and a torso, we deserve to catch a bullet. Kowalski, go help Baker. Kersey instructed. The private nodded and moved over to his reloading friend. Which one do you want? Baker asked, motioning past the large pile of corpses. Kowalski cocked his head and tapped his chin, then pointed towards a six-foot-tall zombie missing a significant portion of his face and neck. Let's get that big boy over there, he said. All right, Baker agreed, and took out the last two on either side before holstering his gun. Any thoughts on how to do this? Kowalski nodded. Get behind him and secure his arms. He waited for his companion to flank the creature before clapping his hands a few times. Hey, big fella, come at me. He stamped a foot, and the zombie screamed, lunging at him. Baker took the distraction and leapt forward, grabbing its arms and pulling them back hard. He was able to hold its wrists with a firm foot planted in its back, keeping its snapping jaws safely in the other direction. Kowalski reached for his knife and then remembered it wasn't there anymore. Shit, he muttered. Baker paled. Shit? What do you mean, shit? Hey, lady, Kowalski barked, turning to Linda, who was closest to him. I need your knife. She headed over and drew it, handing it to him hilt first. Here you go, soldier boy. The private took it and braced a hand on the zombie's chest before gently shoving the knife up into the bottom of the corpse's chin. He was careful to angle it so that it wouldn't pierce the brain. The zombie tried to snarl, but the knife held its mouth closed. Thanks. Kowalski grinned at Linda. She shrugged. Any time. Hey, Sarge, we got one, the private declared. Help me get the vest on him and we'll be good to go. Kersey picked up the vest and headed over, brats on his heels. They managed to shimmy it over the confused and enraged creature, and then the sergeant turned to Johnson. Go get that door unlocked, but leave it shut, he instructed, patting their new pet zombie on the shoulder. We're gonna do this thing. Chapter 15 Bratz held fast to the back of the zombie's vest, the corpse struggling and unable to understand it didn't have the ability to bite. Johnson finished unlocking the door before moving behind the corporal, holding tightly to the back of his vest to keep him steady for their charge. The other four stood behind them, checking their weapons as they got ready to breach the door. Brett, Johnson, Kowalski, you three push forward and get to the stairwell to secure it, Kersey instructed. If anybody's hostile, don't be afraid to shoot them. That definitely wasn't going to be an issue, Sarge, Kowalski quipped. Kersey nodded. 
Baker, Linda, and I are going to hit the principal's office. Hopefully when that announcement goes out, we'll have people laying down their arms. What are we going to do with them if they do? Bretz asked over the frustrated grunting of his undead prisoner. There's only a handful of us. There's a cage in the gym with people who need to be freed, Linda explained. They'll be able to help out. Bretz shrugged. Good enough for me. Okay, let's do it, Kersey said, and nodded to Kowalski. The private reached around the zombie and wrapped his fingers around the handle of the door. He gave a silent countdown from three with his fingers and then yanked it open. The bulletproof zombie caught a shot in the chest as soon as it breached the door, followed quickly by several more cracks as Bretz maneuvered his meat shield forward. There were only four men firing, two in the stairwell and one on each side of the hall, poking out of classrooms. The soldiers moved at a swift pace, easily shoving the giant zombie with their combined weight. Kowalski and Baker leaned out from opposite sides of their single-file charge, firing downrange towards the guards. Their shots missed, but it forced their attackers to get back into their cover. When they reached the principal's office, Baker dove for the door, taking cover there to lay down fire at the shooters. Kersey and Linda slipped by him into the office, the sergeant sweeping the area quickly to make sure there were no straggling hostiles there. It's clear, he said. Get to the intercom. Linda didn't need to be told twice and rushed over to start it up. Bretz pushed on, nearing the stairwell. The zombie was no longer walking, as most of its body had been completely shredded, chunks and limbs falling off in droves by the time they got closer to their attackers. The corporal yanked the knife from the zombie's chin before shoving it face first into the stairwell door. Regardless of the fact that it had no working limbs, it was still starving and latched onto one guard's shoulder with gnawing teeth. He screamed in pain and fell backwards against the other shooter, who leapt out of the way and lunged towards Brett's, gun raising. The corporal batted the barrel to the side and buried the knife into the guard's bicep causing him to drop his weapon and scream. Bretz drew it and then plunged it into the guard's throat, kicking the gurgling man back onto his companion and the pile of rotting flesh still feasting away. Kowalski and Johnson hopped over the tangle of bodies into the stairwell, the former keeping post at the doorframe to keep an eye on the hallway. Johnson fired three times, putting a bullet into each of the twitching bodies' heads. You two, secure the hall, Brett said moving past Johnson to the stairs. I'll make sure nobody comes at us from above. A loud beep echoed all around them as the corporal headed up the stairs. There was a click, and then the sound of Linda clearing her throat. All right, everybody, listen up, it's Linda, she began. You all know what's going on here is wrong. My new friends and I are here to put a stop to it and end Sean's reign of terror. If you lay down your guns and step out of the gym and classrooms with your hands up, you get to live. You'll also have the opportunity to build this city back up. I've made a deal with the military, and they're going to be bringing in food and other vital supplies so we can thrive. All you have to do is put your weapons down and come out. If you're going to do it, do it now. She released the intercom button and let out a deep breath. Kersey raised an eyebrow at her, half smiling. We made a deal with you? He asked. Not yet, she cocked her head. But it sounded more believable than saying I got you to promise them hookers and blow. Whatever gets them to surrender, right? The sergeant nodded. Spot on, girl. He headed over to Baker, still guarding the door. How we looking? He asked. Clear on this end, the private reported. Should be safe to move up to the stairwell. The trio moved quickly down the hall, Linda in the middle, and as they reached the stairs, Kowalski and Johnson stepped out aiming towards the gym. The doors to the gymnasium opened, and a dozen men stepped out, unarmed with their hands raised. Their eyes were wide and fearful, with a hint of relief when they saw Linda surrounded by soldiers. Bratz emerged from the stairwell, having cleared the landing above. I don't see Sean, Kersey muttered. She shook her head. Me either, but I didn't expect to. Anybody else missing? The sergeant asked. She studied the group, lips pursed. Two, maybe three more, not including Sean. Bretz, help Johnson and Kowalski corral these assholes, Kersey instructed. Baker, you're with me. Linda, can you come with us? 
You know this place better than I do. She nodded. Let's go. The three of them turned and headed up the stairs, pausing at the top landing. Kersey did a silent countdown before pushing on the door, and a hail of bullets immediately ripped through the wood. The trio flattened themselves against the concrete wall, staying stock still in hopes of playing possum. After several seconds of quiet, tentative footsteps sounded in the hallway, moving closer to them. Kersey ducked down, laying on his side so that he could aim out the door. He gave Baker a thumbs up, and the private gave the latch a shove. Gunfire ripped again, but it was at chest height, and Kersey fired from the floor, hitting his target in the face. As the body fell, the sergeant caught a glimpse of Sean and one of his lackeys diving back into a room. He remained on the floor, the door resting on his knee as he continued to aim at the room. Baker, move up, he whispered. His companion stepped over him, keeping his gun trained on the offending door down the hall. Once he was clear, Kersey got to his feet and began to move up the hallway, Linda quietly following. Give it up, Sean, it's over, the sergeant called. Your men downstairs have surrendered. You and your little friend there are all that's left. So why don't you be a good boy and come out with your hands up? Linda here might even let you live. He glanced over his shoulder at her, and she shook her head. He offered her a smile and a wink, and then turned back to the door. His smile dropped immediately at the sound of a woman whimpering, and Linda realized what room they'd approached. That's the room where they kept us, she breathed. Baker shook his head. Fuck, they have hostages. Sean, you may want to rethink the whole hostage taking, Kersey bellowed. Didn't work out too well for you the last time. The door suddenly flung open, and Sean emerged, dragging a naked woman out by the throat. He held her in front of him, using her terrified form as a human shield. Put him down, boys, or else the whore gets it in the head, he demanded. Baker scoffed. Yeah, we're not doing that. Sean, Kersey cut in. You gotta understand something here. This ain't the good old days where they'd lock you up in county for a few weeks until your lawyer could get you probation. There is a 0% chance we're going to let you walk out of this. Too many other things to deal with than assholes like you. The girl let out a ragged sob as Sean pressed the barrel of his gun harder into her temple. Linda locked eyes with the lackey from the doorway, an overweight fellow that she recognized. Connor, it's Linda, you remember me? She asked gently. Sean growled. Don't listen to that bitch. It's you and me, buddy. Stand fast. Connor, Linda continued, ignoring the blonde. Sean isn't going to be able to help you anymore. I'm going to be in charge. I know you're a great door guard, and I'm going to have people for you to guard. The frightened man nodded. God damn it, Connor, Sean roared. Don't listen to her. I'm the only one you need. Shoot that bitch now. Connor, Linda said again, voice gentle and smooth. I'll be forever grateful if you'll help us disarm Sean. She licked her lips and batted her lashes. And I show my gratitude. The lackey's eyes widened with realization, and he immediately stepped out from the doorway, aiming his handgun at the back of Sean's head. You stupid motherfucker, the blonde growled. Connor shook his head. I'm sorry, Sean, but I'm with her now, he said, voice shaking. The blonde let out a grunt of frustration, realizing wholly that he was defeated. He raised his arms, stepping back, and Baker quickly moved to him, snatching the gun and bringing Sean to his knees. The girl staggered away, grabbing Kersey's vest, and he gingerly put an arm around her as she sobbed into his chest, shielding her body with his own. Linda approached Connor. You did good, she said. He turned nervous eyes on her. I did? You did amazing, she assured him, and gently took the gun from his hand. He grinned at her, and she smiled back, before smashing the weapon against the bridge of his nose. He collapsed in shock, and she kicked him completely over, kneeling on his chest to continue raining blows down on his face. Kersey gaped at the scene, watching as she spit on the broken and blubbering man's face. Fuck you, you rapist piece of shit, she screamed. You're gonna get what's coming to you. She moved out of the way as Baker shoved a bound Sean down onto the floor next to Connor. He produced another zip tie to secure the bloodied man's wrists, and Linda stepped over to join Kersey. 
The sergeant shook his head in awe. That was one hell of a bluff. He's always looked at me like that, she said bitterly. Even before this shit went down, figured I could use it to my advantage for once. Good call, Kersey said. Any idea on what you want to do with Sean? Linda's eyes darkened, and she grinned deviously. Oh yeah, I have one. Chapter 16 Sean gripped the chain-link fence in the gym, eyes wide with panic. He knew there was no point in trying to escape the fence hallway. He built it, after all. Please, he turned to Linda, injecting as much pain into his voice as he possibly could. Please, I'll do anything you want. She raised her chin and stared him down. I want you to climb. He clenched his jaw, shaking his head, knowing she wasn't going to back down. This was it. Johnson, if you wouldn't mind, Linda said, and the private wandered over to the door and pulled the chain to release the zombies into the fence hallway. They locked on Sean and staggered towards him, moaning and stumbling. Sean dove into the rope pen as soon as they raised the gate, grasping for the rope. He climbed frantically, screaming in fear as the zombies reached for him, barely scraping the bottom of his shoes. Looks like I owe you five bucks, Sarge, Kowalski declared. Kersey grinned. Told you he was gonna get above them. Yeah, but come on, they're touching his feet, the private replied, motioning to the rotting fingers brushing the screaming man's shoes. Can I get a judge's ruling on that? Because I feel like that counts. Linda raised a hand. Sorry, if they ain't eating him, it doesn't count. Well, fuck, Kowalski replied, but he didn't sound all that put out. Kersey inclined his head to the cage at the far end of the gym, where they'd corralled the other undesirables. What's your plan for them? he asked. I figure we'll let them stew in their own shit for a day or two, Linda replied, not even sparing them a glance. Then I'll take them out back and put a bullet in the back of their heads. Or the front, I haven't decided yet. Kersey's brow furrowed. Linda, you're not a killer. Brett snorted and shook his head. Oh, hell yes, she is. Oh, well, I suppose the corporal thinks otherwise, the sergeant said. Regardless, I can't let you kill them. With all due respect, sergeant, Linda said firmly. You guys are leaving. I have to do what I can to ensure my people's safety. Kersey put up a hand. I understand that. I'd like to make a deal with you. I'm listening. Linda crossed her arms, though she was still watching Sean struggle to stay on the rope. The bulk of the surviving U.S. military is currently stationed in Kansas, and we're on a mission to clear a path to the Northwest, Kersey explained. There's going to be a major offensive, and soon. Now my general has given me orders to find a stopover point for troops being transported to the front lines, and I think your little town would be perfect. She wrinkled her nose. You want to flood my town with troops? Being a troop hub will have its benefits, the sergeant insisted. Steady supply of food, medicine, doctors. Not to mention, you'll never have to worry about someone like Sean ever again. She pursed her lips and thought for a moment. Okay, I accept your offer. However, I don't see what that has to do with offing these assholes. We're about to go on a full war footing in this country, Kersey said. And even though we've never fought a war like this in our nation's history, one thing remains the same. Linda raised an eyebrow. What's that? We always have a use for warm bodies, the sergeant explained. She smiled as she imagined what would be in store for the abusive assholes if they became fodder for the military. Okay, I'll spare the ones in the cage, she agreed. But surely you can grant me a lone exception. Kersey smiled, knowing what she wanted, and nodded. Hey, Kowalski, you any good with that thing? Linda asked, motioning to the sniper rifle on his shoulder. He puffed out his chest. I'm pretty good, actually. Fantastic. She clapped her hands together. Now that I'm in charge, I've decided to make some decorating decisions. First of which is that I don't think we're going to need a rope in the gym anymore. I don't know where the ladder is. Would you mind taking it down for me? Kowalski grinned. Not at all, ma'am. He tipped an invisible hat at her and unslung his rifle from his shoulder, aiming at the top of the rope. No, Sean screamed, clambering up another knot, white knuckled. No, please no. The private fired a well-placed shot, severing the rope 
and sending the shrieking blonde ex-leader down to his death. The group watched as the zombies descended on him, reaping the benefits of his own rigged game and tearing into his unwilling flesh. Chapter 17 Yo, Mason, Johnson barked as the soldiers approached the waiting train. You enjoy slacking off while the rest of us were getting shot at? Mason scoffed. Slacking off? You have any idea how cranky Bill gets when he doesn't get enough sleep? Fair enough, Bubba, Johnson replied, clapping him on the shoulder. Fair enough. Where is Bill anyway? Kersey asked, stretching his arms above his head. Mason motioned to the engine car behind him. He's been sound asleep on the floor of the cab since we got here. He's been asleep on a metal floor this whole time? Bratz laughed. Did you at least get him a pillow? Nope, Mason replied with a shrug. He just rolled up a jacket and was out like a baby on NyQuil. Bratz shook his head. Son of a bitch, guess he wasn't lying when he said he could sleep on the train. Lesson learned, Baker declared. I'd be quite content not making another stop like this one. Hey, Mason, why don't you head on back, Kersey said. Kowalski and I will take the first watch with Bill. The private in question gawked at his superior. What the fuck, Sarge? I got the last kill, that means I get the first nap. Technically, Linda got the last kill since it was her idea, Johnson cut in. Plus, she gave you the order. It's like giving credit to the hammer instead of the carpenter. Kowalski shook his head and climbed up into the cab. Maybe Bill will loan me that jacket, he muttered. The trio of remaining privates headed off to the makeshift sleeping car, leaving just the corporal and his sergeant. That was a close one, Brett said, tone serious. Hit us pretty good on the ammo as well. Yeah, I know, Kersey replied, exhaustion finally seeping into his muscles. He leaned against the side of the train, scrubbing a hand down his face. How bad is it? Linda was able to spare us a few boxes of rifle ammo, so Kowalski is sitting pretty, the corporal said. Rest of us are really low, like maybe eight full mags between us on the assault rifles and about six shots each on the handguns. Well, we can't wait on a resupply, the sergeant explained. So we're just gonna have to hope we can find a gun shop along the route. He scratched the back of his head. Bratz yawned, and hope we don't run into much resistance. Kersey waved his hands back and forth in front of his companion's face. What, what are you doing? Bretz asked, brow furrowing. Wondering how you are keeping up a conversation while being asleep on your feet, the sergeant said. Because what you just said is a pure dream. They shared a chuckle, and he patted his friend on the shoulder. You go get some sleep. I'm gonna call the town in to the general. Bretz raised his hand. Be sure to tell him about my field promotion. Sure thing. Kersey laughed. He watched the corporal amble off to the sleeping car and then hauled himself up the ladder into the cab. Bill sat at the console, rubbing the sleep out of his eyes as he checked the gauges. Kowalski's form shuffled around in the corner, attempting to get comfortable with the jacket pillow. How are we looking, Bill? Kersey asked. The engineer made a circle with his thumb and forefinger. Looking all right, Sergeant. Everybody tucked into their beds? They're about as comfortable as they're gonna get, Kersey said. Bill nodded and cracked his knuckles. Well, let's get this show on the road then. Hey, Bill, Kowalski grunted from the back, rolling over to face them. Any place else we need to start worrying about? Please tell me that this place was the worst we're gonna see before Seattle. Well, the engineer drew out the word, rubbing his chin. We still have to go through Helena, Montana but the real ass clench and run is gonna be through Missoula. Kowalski's brow furrowed. You know he has nightmares, right? Kersey said. Well, he'd better, because it's gonna be a bitch and a half getting through it, Bill replied. There's a huge train yard, and it's the biggest city between here and Washington. The sergeant sobered. Any chance we can go around it? Nope. The engineer shook his head, popping the pee as he said it. It's the only viable path through the Coeur d'Alene National Forest. Unless you want to take a huge detour down to Idaho, in which case we'd have to go through Boise, which would be a hell of a lot worse. Kersey sighed. Well, we don't have to do that today, do we? Nah, we're a few days out, Bill assured him. The sergeant stretched his arms above his head. 
good, he said. At least I can get one more mediocre night's sleep before I die. He patted Bill on the back, and the engineer gave him a salute and hit the throttle. End of book two.